it kind of it just doesn't seem quite as good evening i'd like to call this wednesday march 4th 2020 regular meeting of the scarborough town council to order uh, first is the pledge of allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is roll call. Councilor Gucci? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Gleistein? Here. Councilor Katerina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here. Item number four is general public comments. Is there anybody in attendance tonight that would like to speak to anything not on the agenda? None? Item number five is approval of the minutes from the February 19th, 2020 regular town council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mm -mm. All those in favor? Item number six is adjustments to the agenda and I believe we do have one adjustment to the agenda. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, propose that we move order uh, number 20-034, uh, the request from the BOE to authorize impact fees for eight corners, uh, that that be moved to the top of the agenda this evening. And specifically under new business, correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Any, is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Do, I, do we vote on this? Well, let's vote on it. All those in favor? Item number seven is items to be signed. I, I have already done so before the meeting. Order number 20024, a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to the Chapter 311, the Town of Scarborough Schedule of Fees. And this is brought to us by the Fire Chief. The fire Chief is not in attendance. We'll be right along, but I think I can introduce this. Uh, this pertains to the changes uh, to the fire alarm system ordinance. Uh, that's your next item on your agenda. Uh, so as a part of that new system, he's proposing a new set of fees. And that's for uh, the different levels of monitoring uh, that we, we offer our private residents. Okay, and before we get into it, is there any members of the public that would like to speak? This is a public hearing as well as second reading. None? Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, we discussed this uh, in ordinance. We didn't get into the fees uh, per se in the, you know, analyzing anything to do with fees or whatnot, but these are the costs that were brought forward. And I believe they've been brought forward to the those people who will be affected by this change so that it's nothing that's they, no one knows. Let's put it that way. Shouldn't be any surprise. Okay. Great. I had a question on the fees. Yes. Um, so, what part of the budget do they go to? Are they, what what account are they going to go to? Uh, I believe they uh, they are shown as a fire uh, a revenue of the fire department. They always have been. And so I am not proposing any change. Um, Frankly, I have not looked at the revenues as part of the proposed budget, but I expect that's what I'll see, see them. So, to the chair, I have a question for the town manager as well. When um, those fees are spent, are they appropriated, or does the town manager have authorization to spend them on its own without going through the budget cycle of the, the council? No, we, we reflect them as, as, uh, as revenues, and so the, the commitment is, is a net number, so it's less non property tax fees, including something like this. Does that answer your question? So the revenue, but when we actually spend the fees from the reserve account, is that something that you come to the council yes. for approval? Okay. Yeah, very often it may be included as part of a budget, uh, okay. but if not, I, I don't have any spending authority. Uh, council controls all of that. And the ordinance doesn't grant that authority? No, okay. certainly but, not. Thank you. So the question um, and section Townwide uh, section, I can't, I cut and paste it, so it might have been four and now it's six. I, I can't quite tell. Um, it said uh, municipal wireless radio mesh alarm system. The town of Scarborough is transitioning from a legacy hardwired municipal fire alarm system to a modern wireless, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so I was just curious as to, um, is there a reason why, and maybe someone on the ordinance committee can uh, answer this, because sometimes it feels like, you know, our ordinances get, get dated, and, you know, at some point, we're not transitioning anymore, we're transitioned. So I'm just curious as to why, um, you know, it wouldn't just say, you know, this is related to a wireless radio mesh alarm system as opposed to kind of an explanation, which I could see outside of the ordinance, but um, the, uh, the explanation, it goes on. There's actually quite a bit of explanation around this, but it, it seems to kind of date the ordinance almost immediately as soon as we transition. I think, just real quick, that is on order number 2020. Oh, uh, zero one seven, which is the sorry. next one. We're, this, we're so, the fees. Yeah, yeah, let's do the sorry. fees. And yep, sorry about that. We'll hold I that question else first. On the fees. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any anything else on the fees? No. Okay. With that, all those in favor? Thank you. Uh, order number twenty zero one seven is a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter <laughs> six zero seven, the Town of Scarborough Alarm Systems Ordinance, to repeal Chapter six zero seven A, the Town of Scarborough. Fire Suppression and Detection Ordinance. This is brought to us by the Ordinance Committee. And uh, Mr. Hall, do you want to tee this one up and then? Fire chief oh, the chief's here. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Nothing like hit the ground running, Chief. <laughs> Good evening. This is a uh, combination of two different ordinances that we've combined into one. It's been through the Ordinance Committee review process and came out of that committee uh, unanimously to support the changes. It really involves um, some updates due to the new public safety building and the new municipal fire alarm system that we've uh, installed to replace our old legacy copper wire system. Any questions for the chief while he's up there? None? Thank you. Do I, I had a question. Sure. Um, sorry, I was trying to find it. It's not a change, um, <clears throat> but the um, the civil violations. I was just wondering if you could explain that. Um, that's you know, just since we have you here, it's it's from the uh, section, new section. Um, I guess it's 14, civil violations. Yeah, the only change in that is uh, the uh, new language. It talks about each day a violation is allowed to continue um, after notice to correct the violation shall constitute a separate violation came from the ordinance that we've uh, moved into this one to combine that the two together. Rid of? Okay. And does this happen very often? I mean, I can't recall in my 19 years if it ever happened. Okay, all right, thank you. So this, to build on that, this would be a $300 <coughs> fine each day that it's in violation. Is that correct? I have to notice if folks just don't take care of the problem. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, would this apply to anyone who's going to hook up to the system or anyone who just gets a system, say, off of Amazon? Or how does that, how does that work? I mean, it hasn't happened in 19 years, so. <laughs> yeah, I honestly don't believe that it's an issue. I think it's as simply as it's stated. It, it has never been an issue whatsoever. Yeah. Any more? Okay, with that, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And Councilor Glyson, do you want to restate your question? Up on 20017. Actually, this I think this is for ordinance, not you, Chief. I think you're good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right, so, um, I'm sorry, I cut it and pasted it, and then uh, it's, it's kind of hard to find all the markups, but um, the question was that um, there's language in the, in the ordinance explaining that we're transitioning away, um, and so I'm just wondering why that's in the ordinance as opposed to just sort of language introducing this, but then the, the ordinance itself didn't just address the, the change, you know, the, the system that we're, we're putting in. Yeah, I, to be fair, I think uh, you know that, that's some historical context that doesn't have any any bearing, per se. Um, but by the same token, I'm not sure that it's harmful um, being there. But I think it really is there for historical purposes to appreciate what's happened in the system and why why we're doing this now. 
Okay, thank you. Are there any others? Yeah, I think my quick comment is, uh, Councilor Gleisen, I, I agree with you here. I mean, I don't know if this changes anything for me tonight, but I do think that this doesn't serve much purpose, so to speak, and this is a law on the book, so it doesn't necessarily need the two paragraphs of historical. Right, it just it just makes it dated right, right away. Yep. Okay, with, any others? Okay, with that, all of those in favor? Okay, next is order number 20018, second reading in the proposed, um, excuse me, on the proposed amendments to chapter 303, the Scarborough Personnel Ordinance, and this is from Ordinance Committee and Human Resources. I can just do a quick introduction. Liam Gallagher, HR Director, is here if you need further uh, detail, but there are two, uh, two changes coming forward, one dealing with how we calculate overtime and compensatory leave, and the other dealing with retirement. Mr. Gallagher has been before the Ordinance Committee on several occasions mm -hmm. uh, and is, is available to speak to the issue uh, tonight if you wish. Are there any questions for Mr. Gallagher? All right, thanks for popping in. <laughs> <laughs> is there a uh, motion on the so floor? So moved. <laughs> And a second? Yes. Second. Discussion? Mr. Hamill? Yes, I'd just like to add that there was a fair amount of uh, uh, checking on this ordinance. There was a lot of back and forth discussion. We got input from uh, Mike Shaw, whose department would be you know, impacted by these changes. And we confirmed for both of these changes that the uh, they would be beneficial, number one, uh, they would be well received from a morale standpoint, number two, and number three, that uh, their impact, their financial impact would be minimal so um and thanks to liam for you know for uh sussing that out and helping us to get a grasp on those items any more now i'd just like to add uh mr gallagher your memo was made it very easy to understand so i can appreciate it because this is definitely not something that i'm familiar with but your examples in here are great so thank you uh with that all those in favor Okay, moving on to order number 20026, act on the names posted to the Long Range Planning Committee by the Appointments and Negotiations Committee at the February 19th, 2020 Town Council meeting. And this is brought to us from Appointments and Negotiations. So, Mr. Hamill? Yes, those are, uh, as soon as I scroll up to them, though, this is the second reading. Um, we tried to focus on uh, staffing up the, the required committees, and um, um, that would be for the Long Range Planning Committee, committee uh, reappointing Robin Saunders and Dave Merrill to full voting members with terms to expire in 2022. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All right. Okay, moving on to a new business. We're in, we're in, um, we're going to put order number 20034 at the top of the list. It is moved for approval and request from the school board, Scarry, Scarry, uh, from the Scarborough Board of Education to authorize the use of school impact fees for the eight corners portable overage in the amount not to exceed $51,000. Uh, this is a request from the Board of Education. Uh, Ms. Bolton, do you want to give us a brief overview or? Or not? It's either one. Yes. At least this evening, I have most of my voice. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> the last time we got together to talk about this, I couldn't talk at all. So I'm, I'm halfway back. Um, this is a, an item that was brought to uh, the town council in a workshop with the board on the 12th of February, and had been discussed uh, in finance committees for some time prior to that. Um, the uh, town council voted to provide $260,000 in school impact fees, reserve fees, in April of 2019 for what I would call an emergency purchase of uh, two portable classrooms for eight-quarter school. 
since we put that project together rather quickly, um, it did run over budget. And so the school board finance committee came to the town council finance committee and asked for additional funding to cover that overage. I know folks here have seen a lot of material on this. Are there any specific questions that I can help with? None, no, thank you. Are there any members of the, the public? cough drop still here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before we start, are there any members of the public who would off, like to offer comment? None? Okay, is there a motion on the table? So moved. Second. And some discussion? To the chair. Uh, yep. So I, I feel like we need to catch the public up on some correspondence that we've had. Yep. Um, and that's, I, I believe, resulting in a, a, a motion to amend uh, this as it currently reads. So um, I've been doing a lot of research on this because it doesn't make a lot of technical sense to me, not, and I get stuck on things when they don't make technical sense. So. Um, the, the first thing I, I, I looked at was, well, this looks like we're increasing the appropriation for schools, and you can't really do that because of, uh, you know, we, we have the voters validate the budget. So uh, the first point of order that I requested or I, I sent through email to the chair was for clarification of, is this a violation of the charter and by reference state statute where we are not allowed to amend the school budget? Um, midterm without following a, a, a procedure that's described in statute. And we did get a response from the town's attorney on that that I believe is in front of everybody. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at it. Um, so that was the first, uh, I guess, point of order or, or clarification that I was looking for. The, the second one related to whether this was a valid use of the fees. And I felt like there was um, some relevant information lacking from the agenda packet. Uh, that would allow counselors to make an informed decision. Um, and that specifically was the, uh, so you can only use impact fees, and I guess this is my interpretation, not necessarily the law, but um, the way I read it is you can only use impact fees for the purposes that they were um, collected under. And when I read our impact fee ordinance, um, it reads as uh, referencing a document from 2001 that was submitted to the DOE, and that document was not included with the packet. So I felt like counselors should have the opportunity to review that material to make a decision. And um, to my pleasure, the chair included uh, an abridged copy that I, after having looked at it, I think is probably going to be sufficient for discussion uh, with our packet. So those are the, uh, those are my parts of kind of what we were working, I guess, behind the scenes, probably the right way to say it. And, um, and I can see that there's an order in front of me to amend or a motion to amend. I don't know if you want to jump into that or do more discussion. Well, I guess do you want to raise your, do you want to formally raise those your points of order and I want I address them or do you? Do sure, you, we okay. could do I, that or okay. I mean, <coughs> so let's let's go to the first. It'd be good for us to figure out how to do a point of order. Yeah, I think, right. Because I, I don't. I just, really want, I just want the practice. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I'll raise my first point of order. Okay. Perfect. And. Uh, well, I, we, I'll just restate it. I'm not going to read it. Was that is this a, um, uh, in compliance with our charter and state statute? Um, given that we participate in the budget referendum validation process, um, because to me it reads as an appropriation to the school department for the purpose of operating our schools. Um, so I guess that's the first one. What do we do from here? I think I'm going to respond to that okay. one. Okay. Um, and if I have this, just to make sure I have this right, I respond to it, and then we move forward unless the council wants to overrule my thoughts. I think so. Correct. Correct. So there's no debate on this. I make a call and then if you want to. There could be a motion in a motion second to, to overrule my overrule. decision. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll say what I think is going on in plain English and then I'll read the lawyer's opinion for the record and so everybody can read along. And uh, So Councilor Clucci raised some very legitimate concerns. The charter specifically says in a nutshell that the Board of Education is unable to um, increase the appropriation out of budget cycle and if they want to do that they have to have an emergency budget meeting and then the appropriation the extra appropriation is then discussed and then that extra appropriation has to go back to the voters and so the long and the short of it is is the question is is this violating the charter um, I'm going to tell you my interpretation of legal opinion and then I'll read it uh, I talked to Phil Saucier today and uh, pretty much the conclusion is is this is actually a fund that is controlled, it's a revenue fund that's controlled by the town and the town council. Um, and so 
the BOE or the Board of Education would not be spending this money. We're, we're paying for these portables. So the town is stepping in to say, we're not going to expand your appropriation by $51,000, but we're going to cut a check to whoever, whatever money you owe to whatever vendor it is for $51,000. That was my interpretation. So I'm going to read it uh, quickly. As we discussed under both state law 30 AM, AMRS uh, statute 4352A and town ordinance chapter 145 chapter 2, the town council has the authority to both impose impact fees on certain development projects and expend those funds on authorized improvements. Any such impact fee revenues, even if designated for school infrastructure costs, are held by the municipality, in parentheses, segregated from the general fund revenues and not by a school department. And, the on, uh, and only the town council can authorize appropriations of those funds. Although not applicable in this instance, since the town has a school department, the statute also makes it clear that a municipality can use impact fee funds for its proportional share of any anticipated school capital costs. Likewise, in the event a school department anticipates certain capital costs and includes those costs in their proposed budget, the, ca the town can use the designated school impact fees uh, funds for certain authorization costs to uh, fund those expenditures. So with that, my response to the Fordham order is I am willing to let this stand and go forward because I, I have been satisfied with this opinion and the interpretation. So I will pause if somebody would like to challenge my interpretation. No? I'll motion to challenge. Yep, perfect. Yeah, sure. Okay. But, but it would need to be seconded, yep. I believe. Yeah. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second it for discussion. Sure. Sure. Okay. okay. And we're discussing it. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I guess my, my rationale is I, I, I think it is a violation. And the uh, attorney's interpretation is uh, loose, I guess is what I would say. Um, and I think it would cover us should we uh, have uh, you know, a suit filed, which isn't going to happen in this case. Um, but I don't want to go there. I, I feel like it sets a precedent. We set a precedent last year. And uh, uh, it's probably unnecessary. If it was an emergency, like my understanding from the materials that were provided was that there's room within the school budget to cover these fees by making some adjustments. Um, so I don't feel like it's something that warrants this type of action from the council. So that's, I, that's my case. Okay. Yeah. Any more to add to that? Councilor Hayes? Well, just a question. When you said your information suggests there's room within their budget to meet the needs, can you clarify? I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Bolton to clarify. I believe it was included either on the Finance Committee packet that we had or the one that we have here. There, was an alt there were alternative funding sources identified on the spreadsheet. Uh, John, you're correct. There is a spreadsheet included in the packet. I'm looking for a page here. Uh, of the 168 page packet yeah yeah yes. and I don't have yes. I don't have page I numbers but there is a, there's a spreadsheet included uh, that shows that if the town council is unable or unwilling to provide the extra monies that we will divert funds from other projects in our capital budget um, on the school board side to cover this uh, $50,000 cost and we did identify two areas where the uh, the expenditures could uh, legitimately be charged to, and we would simply be diverting those funds from the projects that they were originally intended to. Do you anticipate in expending those funds this fiscal yeah. year? Uh, if we had them, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we have decided that if we don't have the monies available because we need them for eight corners, we've identified areas where we can save those monies and, and use them. Uh, I actually have it here. I just don't know how to reference okay. it in the packet. Does that help? It does. Councilor Hayes. This is a follow-up. So what, what would be the impact if you deferred those capital projects? Um, the two areas which we identified were in security and access management and in district-wide plumbing. Um, district-wide what? Plumbing. Plumbing. It's an exciting category. Is there a crisis? I mean, is <laughs> could I ask, could I ask the and cooling type things? Or? Um, actually, no, it's, it's replacement of uh, some 
uh, toilets, to be precise, well, that's fun, yeah. and some sinks. Uh, we have some failing toilets in one of the buildings, and we've been uh, nibbling away at them in the operating budget, but wanted to do a wholesale replacement. And uh, the other piece is uh, custodial sinks, which are inadequate for our current uses, and were planned to be uh, replaced. So those are obviously not going to change our world, um, but they were part of our normal um, maintenance and, and uh, replacement and repair of equipment. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to vote on my ruling. And I a, think we vote on my your, I'm sorry, your, yeah, yes. Yes, motion so we, to overrule, yeah. Correct. Okay. So all those in favor of Mr. Clucci's motion. Can I, be, before we vote, can yep. I just ask for clear, so yep. <laughs> his motion is to overrule so your interpretation. Determination. Correct, and I believe if I'm overruled, this gets struck from the agenda and we're done with it. Right. Because we've determined that this is, uh, a, this would be a, Violation of the charter the way it's written. And then that would would go to plan B, which would just Correct. Go. Now if I, my understanding is if we want to talk about the funding source, we still have if if we want to discuss do we want them to spend that money out of the two designated accounts, that can be a separate conversation in a few minutes as well. If, yeah. So the other point of clarification is that this relates to the agenda item as it was originally presented to us, not as it will potentially be amended subsequently. Yep. yep. I don't know if we could have sequenced this better, but this is how we Hey, that's it. We're learning. So, yeah. so can, can you clarify that? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, in front of you is a motion to amend this order, um, which is an attempt to address some of the concerns that I had, and the response from the attorney I believe relates to the amended order and not to the order as it was presented to us. I think that's a fair, okay. I, that's my understanding as well. But if we vote for John's motion, we don't get to get to the Correct. amendment part? Correct, yeah, yeah. Can, can we swap this? Is there a way yeah, to do yeah. that? I don't think that's actually right. I mean, I think the, if you support and overrule the chair's ruling, interpretation, uh, you still have to dispense with the matter. The matter's still before the council, so you would either defeat it, pass it, or amend it. So I think okay. so amendments we'll are process. still in play should you wish to offer them, even should this survive. Uh, my per primary rationale for this was to uh, be open about the order in front of us, so I'm fine if it, this moves forward and, and we just keep, keep going. Do you want to withdraw your motion? I can withdraw it, yeah. yeah. Okay, motion withdraw. So where are we now? Now well, we're you had, to yes. well, you, well, you had. You can had can you go them. back to the dummy 101 yes, version? Yes, absolutely. The, the English fact, version of what we're fact, doing? we're back to dummy 101. So okay. we're good. So I'm so, good with dummy 101. Okay, I'm so, good. Uh, I don't want to cause myself some, but there was two points of order. Are you letting the second one? No, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. raise the second one. I, I, and I did cover it before, but um, this one was that I felt like the agenda packet, as it was submitted to us, omitted some relevant information. Um, because the uh, impact fees, the way I read it, are only to be used for the purposes that they were collected for. And our particular ordinance references a document for, that was submitted to the DOE in 2001, and that document was not included with the package. That was what I raised as a point of order, was I, I felt like the council mm -hmm. should have that information to be able to make an informed decision. And um, to my pleasure, it, it has been provided, it's in front of us now. So, Okay. You can rule on it, but I guess it's... Uh, now, yeah. we're good. I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, with that, we're back to the motion on the table. And is there any discussion on the motion on, on the table? Which motion is on the table? The, I will read, yep, I'll read it one more time. <laughs> main motion. Yep, the main motion. Main motion. So okay. move, move approval on the request from the Scarborough Board of Education to authorize the use of school impact fees for eight corners portable coverage in the amount not to exceed 51000 I have a, I would like to make a motion to amend, and then I would move to amend order, to, and this is all in front of you, and there's one copy in the audience if anybody's interested. Um, I'm going to move to amend order 20034 to read as follows. 
move approval on the request from the Scarborough Board of Education and authorize the town manager to use school impact fees for the eight corner portables overage in the amount not to exceed $51,000 consistent with the school impact fee ordinance and the projects contained in the application submitted to the main department of education dated july 26 2001 i'll second the motion yeah and i'm gonna I'll, I'll leave the discussion to explain my motion if that helps so essentially this this amendment is to try to align there's try to align everything that we're talking about so um as i said before i i think there's a legitimate argument to be made that that these are we're not expanding the school's appropriation we are using a revenue account that we have control over to to cover fifty one thousand dollars so what in mo this motion is to clearly state that this is an us authorizing the town manager to spend the money and not the board of education uh, secondly it refers back to this document that is is a very abridged version um, and I think what we've all learned through this process is we probably should update said document and ordinance, so that is some work for a different day. Um, but in this, this was submitted in 2001 to the Maine Department of Education to justify why we're collecting impact fees. And projects that are listed, and I'm only using the first two pages, so I apologize, but right on the first page here, projects that are listed are list schools to be renovated or replaced blue point school eight corner school pleasant hill school and then on the back i've highlighted a couple quick things that say a short-term plan of modular units to meet immediate needs that's not lost on me because i was a 20 year old document um, in fall 2001 16 modular classrooms in addition to those existing will be distributed through the six schools in the scarborough school district so I do not disagree with um, Councillor Cucci's assertion that this this is muddy at best, um, but this motion is an attempt to A, respect the charter, and B, tie it back to this document that our impact fees are married to this document. So that's what this motion is for from my perspective. So discussion on the motion, uh, the, on the amendment, excuse me. Yes. Councillor Hill. No. Yes. I, uh, democracy is messy and this is proof of it uh, I think we with this amended uh, order uh, it moves it from uh, uh, from very murky to uh, some level of visibility and I think that it provides a uh, um, clarity and uh, <coughs> sufficient justification for us to move forward uh, and and vote on this amendment and approve it further discussion on the amendment it's just the amendment Councilor Caterina? Uh, I certainly appreciate uh, the work that Councilor Cucci did uh, in his you know, digging deep and looking at um, the murkiness that uh, wasn't immediately uh, visible to me because um, I was looking at it as, well, you know, it's impact fees, the town, we technically own the buildings in the town, so we were authorizing money to that effect. Um, and I know that I've had some conversations um, with others regarding, you know, are these permanent buildings, are they temporary? Um, but that's getting into going down a whole different rabbit hole that, that you can do as far as is this capital improvements or not. Right. Um, but that being said, I also don't want to be holding up the uh, Board of Education's uh, ability to serve the ch children in the schools. Uh, in town, so I think that this amendment makes perfect sense, and um, I like how uh, Councilor Hamill says it gives us some level of, I guess you said, less murkiness, so <laughs> I would agree with that. Councilor Clucci? Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I, uh, Paul called me after speaking to the town's attorney uh, today and gave me an update, and this is pretty much what I said that you know would, would basically make me comfortable. I was going to draft something, and then I'm like, I'm going to mess it up because this stuff that you know is threading a needle in so many different directions that I didn't want to be the one to introduce it. Um, but I'm glad you did, and it reads, I think, reasonably to me. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, I just want to say I think it's really important that you looked at the charter. I commend you for that. That's really 
really good, um, and I, I also agree with your hesitation on where you where you're coming from on this in relation to the charter. Um, it's one thing to go back to an ordinance, but to go all the way back to the charter, because um, ultimately it's the people's money. It's not our money. So um, those processes are there for a reason. So thank you. Thank you. Um, although I do support the amended motion, um, I really appreciate that work. Okay. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I, and, and this, this may come out wrong. I mean, I will echo everything that was said. Totally appreciate your due diligence in doing it. I do have a concern, though, that, you know, this is our really second bite at this apple. I mean, we really approved 260000 in the in the first round. And this is the type of work that we should have had at the very beginning of the process. I know we, I was going to share, we, we spent some time at the Finance Committee talking about this, and we're told less than a week ago that this document was just not available. So I think... You know, I think as we move through this stuff and complex issues, I don't think murkiness is good. Um, so I think just for us, we just need to make sure we cross our I's and dot our T's. And I look at that as being staff work that needs to get done for us. I mean, it's great that you did it, but it was completely off my screen. I mean, I it went right by me. So I now feel guilty that I didn't hold up my responsibility. But, but that having said that, the other thing I'd like to say, which probably relates back to the main motion, what I'm also concerned about, if you just look at the past three events, we've had a pretty significant cost overrun in this project. We had a pretty significant, we approved a budget of $1.1 million for the turf field and was asked for one6 And we have a cost overrun on the public safety bill. But I just think as we're dealing with projects, we need to make sure that when we're approving them that we have contracts in hands and firm commitments. <coughs> These are three significant cost overruns that are impacting taxpayers and other things. So I hope this is just we can learn and look forward. And for new capital projects coming in the budget process in front of us, that we're pretty comfortable we know what the numbers are going to be. Because this is a second bite. We, this is not a good image that we keep going back to the well saying we don't have the numbers right. Yep. So I will approve this motion. I will approve the main motion because I think we do need to move forward. But I hope we learn from this that this is, we need to you know, dot our I's and cross our T's. Councilor Kluge? I just want to, we're on the. We're just on the amendment. Okay. Yep. So this isn't yep. final, final. Correct. Okay. Got all lost. right. We're voting on the amendment. So all those in favor of, of the amendment. Okay. And now we're back to the main motion as amended. Is there any discussions on the whole enchilada here? Councilor Kluge. Um, and I think this is the last point, and it's really um, fortunate that Jay's here. Uh, there is a second half of this project on our, our barn owners mm -hmm. so that we're mixing items here. But from my perspective, it's important to determine what was built. And it doesn't meet any standard that I'm familiar with, so I can't tell if it's a temporary structure, which from my read of the charter would not apply to the $400,000 limit or if it's permanent. Uh, my instinct says it's temporary, but planning says differently. I was wondering if you could explain uh, the detail. I think it's over. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I just said, I may ask Brian Longstaff, our zoning administrator, to weigh in, because um, this certainly building code isn't necessarily my area of expertise, but in terms of looking at the zoning ordinance, um, I think the way we define a building in a structure really helps to start to inform part of the conversation. Then we can move into the building code if that's the pleasure of the council. Um, so in our zoning ordinance, it defines a building as a structure that has a roof supported by walls. And I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it before me. I wasn't really prepared to speak to this, but Sorry. I know we emailed quite a bit, so I'm... I'm and then, um, so right in the definition of building, we reference structure. In our zoning ordinance, we also have a definition of structure. Structure speaks to, again, paraphrasing, anything affixed to the ground. And so, these structures are determined to be affixed to the ground, both by the um, utilities that are, are brought to the, to the facilities 
the fact that they are, there's tie downs, there's sort of pins that are embedded in the asphalt that are tied. Um, and so in, in sort of zoning vernacular, uh, we look at these as buildings and structures. In terms of um, building code questions, I know you had questions about shouldn't buildings be on foundations or what have you. Um, my understanding in talking with the zoning administrator and, um, and the, uh, uh, our um, commercial code officer is that that's not necessarily a requirement of a structure that they be on foundations and that we are satisfied that these are buildings. Now, they may be temporary or portable or modular or what have you, but in, in sort of the realm of our permitting processes, they're permanent structures. I could not have explained that, so thank you. Um, that, but that is consistent with what you had provided before. Nothing else. Okay. Any more discussion on the main motion as amended? None. Okay, I, I, Councilor Kuchar, I have actually a question for you. When did you when did you finally get the report from two thousand one? <sighs> two or three days ago, okay. um, after the meeting. I guess Tom, fi Tom gave it to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, it wasn't finance. It was um, after a communications committee meeting on this week. Yeah. It's a Monday. And you've, a you've asked for this, I, I think, several times. I, I, I've asked for I it mean, several times, and I've asked for an it's opinion. It's like the Ark of the Covenant. Like, no one knew where it was. It was <laughs> right. I, I've also asked for an opinion from the school department, or the, yeah. the BOE, uh, about whether this was an eligible project, because a, re a response in the affirmative probably would have been enough for me. But... Uh, the fact that I wasn't getting a, a clear response to that, kind of like, I don't know if this is a permanent improvement or not still, which, so it, it's kind of in its own um, world, which creates some concerns for me from a life safety perspective. Um, <coughs> because the way construction works is you follow set procedures and this one doesn't really match up with anything that's defined. Um, yeah. It's probably the best way that I, I could say it. So, uh, But I did get it um, and I did read it and if it was a temporary structure, I can make the connection to this document. Yep. If it was an addition, so if it was connected, as had been presented to the council last year, um, I can make the connection that it is a valid um, use of these yep. impact fees. But what it is is a standalone structure or new addition, which I can't make the connection to this document sure. because of that. Yeah, the only thing I was going to comment on is I kind of, I observed this more than was part of it. So as chair, Councilor Clucci CC'd me in on a lot of things. And I just, I can understand your frustration where I, I feel like you very reasonably asked for certain pieces of information consistently. And I, and, I, and I feel like this was, being able to read this, and this was not a knock on anybody in particular. I just, this, I feel like you felt like you might have been screaming down a well a few times about, because all we wanted, all you wanted to do was look at that. So. I just wanted to acknowledge that. I appreciate your persistence because this took persistence to actually get some clarity on it. So. Just to be fair, uh, I could not find that document oh, right. in our files, and Correct. so I, yeah. I obtained it on Monday and shared it as soon as I had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't a, that was not a I, town I, manager. I will say, Tom or stepped in. I, you yeah. weren't the target of my request. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, with that, all those in favor? All those opposed? Six to one. Moving on, uh, order number 2027, excuse me, no, I am correct, 2027, move approval of the first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map and schedule the public hearing upon receipt of the planning board's recommendation. And this is brought to us from the town manager. Yes, uh, I'll introduce uh, I do see Jay Chase and Karen Martin here who have been assisting me in running um, some neighborhood outreach uh, on this project. Um, if you'll allow me, I'll speak to both uh, orders 27 and 28 as they're, they're related. Um, the first, uh, order number 27, relates to a uh, map, excuse me, a change to the zoning map. And this is essentially to align uh, zone boundaries with property, property lines, which is a practice that we've been 
uh, employing kind of town-wide as methodically as we can, this is one of the uh, final, if not the final holdout, if you will. Uh, I do recall a series of changes down at the Dunstan area. And my only defense as to why this matter had not come before the council earlier is that with the exception of town-owned property, the existing public safety building, there really aren't any other affected property owners. And complacency is no excuse, but I think uh, there was no urgency either uh, until most recently when we uh, uh, marketed the property for sale and actually subsequently now have uh, the property for sale and it's under contract. Not surprisingly, the, uh, the sales contract we have in place does have a contingency, a uh, number of them, including um, this clarification of the, the zone district boundary. Um, as part of this, uh, we have done some neighborhood outreach. Uh, I should back up. Uh, the matter has been taken through the Long Range Planning Commission Committee, which is the normal course of business, uh, starting as early as last October 2019 and uh, kind of sputtered along through the fall, if you will, uh, and has come back to life early in the new year, and here it is in front of us. Um, since the new year, we have done a couple of outreach efforts with the neighbors. Uh, most recently, we had uh, another meeting with them and included the uh, prospective buyer, the developer of the property, whom I think was helpful in putting a face with the name at the very least, and perhaps helping explain some of his vision for the future. And I, I'm quite certain that he intends to further engage them as he uh, refines his plans. So again, that's a long-winded uh, introduction, but what's before you is uh, to align uh, the zone boundary with property lines. And it, it is not limited uh, to this uh, public safety building entirely, as that map will show. It will also try to get it up on the screen to help you see it. So I'll stop there and certainly answer questions if you have them. Uh, any public comment before we proceed? <clears throat> no? Okay. Councilor Harris, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I think we said we we're going to take 27 and 28 together, so I was just curious about when we did do the public outreach, what was the nature of the comments? I, I had heard that there was some concerns about, you know, what's going to be there, the height of the buildings, what are the property setbacks, what's traffic going to be like, what's the use? So I'm just curious about what, yeah, I, what I would, were the concerns of, of the of the members that were there. Yeah, I wasn't there, so okay. I'll, uh, Karen and, and Jay both were, so I think I'll let them speak to it. Uh, I will say that we were not surprised that much of their questions had to do with what the future holds. Right. And we're, we're not in a position to really speak to that. So this last meeting that involved the developer, I think, helped answer some of those questions. But Jay, can you fill us in with uh, how that went? Sure, from um, sort of, I, I think you touched on actually quite a bit of the main concerns really about ex not only um, um, uh, existing traffic uh, within the neighborhood, but how uh, additional development would further potentially um, cause further uh, issues mm -hmm. with traffic. Um, certainly density and scale of the development was a concern. Um, you know, in terms of the rezoning, I, I think, you know, one of the things the uh, developer at the second meeting we had, as Tom uh, mentioned, was able to really talk more about the location of the building that they're looking for. Um, that's part of what will get reviewed through the planning board review process, but certainly I think the scale of the building, I think, um, or certainly some concerns we heard. And, and, um, and what was that concern about the scale? Was it the height? I think the height and the massing um, predominantly, and I know both uh, 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 Councillor Katerina and Gleistein were at the meeting, so certainly, you know, I look to them to, for their, their input on what their, their recollection was as well. But yeah, I think it was really, as I said, sort of the scale and massing of the, of the structure, particularly as it gets closer towards the existing single family resident, uh, residence, uh, yeah, residents, <laughs> um, which are sort of obviously behind the building where Route 1's on the, on the force, front side there. Which, um, which would not be allowed under the current zoning, right? Excuse me? Which would not be allowed under the current not zoning? Not in the R4 section of the, uh, of the, the R4 zoned portion of the property. <clears throat> so right now the property is split zoned, and so um, that's the uh, <clears throat> And I guess a follow-up question. So to the town manager, when you said there were contingencies, what specifically was a representation in the, in the buy-sell agreement and what is a contingency? 
there are five different contingencies, but the one relevant to this issue, and I will quote directly from it, subject to the zoning of the parcel as a whole to the TBC zone, mm -hmm. which is what is before you, is to move the zone line back to uh, match the property line. But nothing about the height of the buildings or other no. expectations about density or there, there's a, the other contingency, it's not an expectation. It, we wouldn't have put this in here, but for the fact that it's allowed under the, under the zone, but it says subject to minimum of 25 units being allowed in the TBC zone, so long as the units are one bedroom and less than 750 square feet. Again, that doesn't require any zone change. That's, uh, that's the density that's allowed currently in the TBC. Thank you. Councilor Kuchi. Um, so I just want this one's complicated, uh, not whether I support it or not, but uh, so we're talking about a particular development, but the zoning change, they can do whatever they want with the property afterwards, right? So to me, the contingency isn't really relevant to the zoning change. They can do whatever complies with the zoning. So the proposal that we have from the developer uh, isn't necessarily what's going to happen to this lot. It probably will. But he could sell it or, you know, circumstances can change and the lot could be developed according to what's allowable in the zone. So I guess I, I, I'm trying to separate the two, um, that we should make sure this makes sense from a zoning perspective. Um, it helps that we kind of understand what probably is going to go there. Just to be clear, the developer wants the assurance or has right. the expectation wants the assurance that uh, the, zone, the property that he's buying will be entirely zoned TBC and sure. is willing to live within the existing and just regulations there. Before we go any further, should we put this on the table if we're going to discuss it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay. And discussion, Councillor Gleistein? So, I, um, I agree with you, John. You know, the what's in front of us is the zoning change. Um, well, there's more than one, but um, so, but there was a question on the table about what happened at the meeting and what the concerns were. Um, and the uh, it was described as that it would be 25 units and if I recall I don't have it right in front of me but there's um, there's about 66 parking spaces there we think um, somewhere between 60 and 66 and so if there were 25 units um, there was an estimate by folks that there would be uh, 35 probably cars that would be there permanently and then a restaurant in the front um, they were saying perhaps people would park in the public lot or do something else, but um, there was a lot of discussion around the traffic and all of the extra cars that would be brought by this zoning change, regardless of what potentially ends up being there. And because it's a proposed residential, it impacts, you know, which goes back to the contract, but it impacts especially um, commutes, right? So a restaurant might not impact commutes as much um, because people might be coming and going at different times of the day to a restaurant. Uh, but the, uh, the actual, because the, the owner, um, should this be rezoned, um, is considering residential, there was a lot of concern about impacts to commuting and safety, um, et cetera. So I'm just answering that question about um, what a lot of the concern was. Um, and then in terms of the zoning itself, um, you know, I personally believe that leaving this as R4 definitely um, uh, protects the, the residential neighborhood behind uh, much better than rezoning it. You can see where it dips down right across the street from a couple of existing homes, um, and then it will back up next to a couple of homes. So. I think the way um, that I would see this is that the, the zoning that's already there um, protects the neighborhoods that are there. Um, and so um, that is, I think, what we want to consider. That's, that's a good, um, uh, and I know that there's comprehensive plan considerations and things like that, but um, if you look at it, the buffer of the R4 right now protects the existing neighborhood better than the um, change to TVC. Councilor Katarina? 
Uh, yeah, uh, just a few comments. Um, first of all, I've been on long-range planning for a while, um, and we've been talking for quite a time, uh, along with not just long-range planning, but with a comprehensive plan of making sure that our zoning aligns with property boundaries. So, you know, I think councillors, okay, sure, you can, you can focus on this particular development um, with the public safety building, which I will address in a second. But if you notice, we're not changing. It's not just there, it's all the way down uh, to correct that deficiency, and it goes with a comprehensive plan. Um, secondly, on my little list here is um, the real estate contingency. Makes sense um, from a, a purely practical point of view. Uh, I can't imagine that you're going to get any buyer who's not going to ask you to make that parcel one zone and not split down the middle of the building. That makes absolutely no sense. So uh, I, if I understood, I believe it was Mr. Hayes asked earlier um, something about the contingency. Well, I can tell you that if the contingency is not met, that gives the uh, buyer the ability to walk, to break the contract. Um, with very little um, um, damage to themselves. That, that's an, you know, we didn't do what we said we were going to do, so they're like, okay, we're all done. So I would hate to see us in a position where we're not going to have this uh, money from the sale of this building because we're going to ne we need that to finish the payment that was part of the deal with doing the public safety building. Um, as for the buffering, our four allows for way less buffering uh, than between um, contingent, which you call contingent properties, uh, than if you have the TVC. Um, I don't remember the numbers. I'm looking at Jay or Karen. Could you speak to the buffering? So what's the buffering? If it's not changed, what's the buffering with the, with the change in the zoning? Sure. Um, so let's see. Um, for between just our four properties, mm -hmm. um, there's a 15 foot building setback, and that's all it says. Um, between a, a TVC zone um, and a, where it abuts a residential zone, R4 in this case, the ordinance requires a 25 foot buffer uh, consistent with the buffering standards in our zoning ordinance. Um, which the planning board applies through any site plan or subdivision review process. And so that often talks about if there's existing vegetation that that be maintained. Um, if there isn't any existing vegetation, then there'd be some type of augmentation. So I've seen, we've seen different applications where the boards had some fence and landscaping might be the answer. And other, you know, it, it varies. It's site, it's site sensitive, site um, um, uh, context sensitive, I guess I should say. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I could continue, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, in regards to the meeting, I did not make the first meeting, but I did make the second meeting. There were four, maybe five property properties represented. There may have been more people there, but the houses represented. And they were, if, if I heard them correctly, they were pretty much immediate abutters or fairly immediate abutters. Um, and I did ask them about, well, right now there's, there are shift changes with fire department and police, uh, so there, there is that traffic at predictable times of day there, um, so I want people to, you know, keep that in mind. And I'm not saying there aren't traffic issues in that, in that particular area of town. That intersection is, is not the best intersection in the world. In fact, I think it's not graded one of the highest in the state. And again, I'm looking at Jane, Karen. Um, that being said, I did talk to the developer after the meeting, and you know he's willing to to look at and work with us in whichever, however possible, in order to you know alleviate traffic concerns. Um, my impression of the people who showed up at the meeting were were. They would be how I would be if I were an immediate abutter. Um, they were had concerns, and very uh, few, quite a few of them were legitimate. But I also 
feel that they are in a place where they don't have a visual to look at. There's not a specific plan that hasn't put before them, so naturally people are afraid of the unknown. And it's that sense of change that I think they were reacting from because there were a few, you know, questions placed, ideas thrown out, and they, at this moment, weren't particularly opening to listening to them. And again, that's my impression. That's my impression of what was going on. Um, that being said, um, I, I, I think I know, and I think this is an awesome uh, use of this particular parcel, what's being brought forward. It's what we want in Scarborough. It's what we call work, f in my business, <laughs> we call workforce housing. Um, it is um, small. You're not going to get people with five cars parking. Um, maybe one car per unit, maybe. Um, and um, I think it would be a good, great addition to the town. And we can be creative with this and look at what we can do with traffic. And that's why we have a planning board. So to bring us back to the original um, intent of all of this is I would ask my fellow counselors not to look at just this, just as it's related to public safety building, but it's related to the whole comprehensive plan and outlining <clears throat> and making sure that our zoning lines line up the way they should, and that's with property boundaries. So that's it. That's my speech for tonight. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Uh, I'm not going to weigh in on the relative uh, merits of the, the issues around the zoning changes uh, other than to say, I mean, we're talking about uh, changing R4 zone to uh, town village center zone. I mean, our, the concept of an R4 zone, you know, even at this day in, uh, you know, the Oak Hill area is a little bit of a, a mystery, you know, how it survived this long. But one thing I do want to talk about, I'm quite sensitive to <clears throat> Some of, I didn't attend either of the neighborhood meetings, but I am sensitive to um, concerns expressed by the uh, by the residents and the butters and the concerns that they have about the impact on their neighborhood. And uh, but I know there's a process for that, and there's a way to address and mitigate many of those issues, as Councillor Katarina has described. My my concern with this is really a, a broader one, and it has to do with uh, I was at the first long range planning committee meeting. Uh, as a, I'm the backup liaison to Councillor Katarina, and I was there when, when the committee was discussing these changes. And at no time <laughs> was there any reference to a pending sale. You know, uh, most of the discussion, most of the reasons that were given in that meeting for these zoning changes were kind of cleanup. And so that, that to me, back in October, you know, a, a month later, we saw the, you know, the uh, the proposed offer, you know, and voted on it as a council a month or two later. I, that bothers me, you know, that, that we should have been, someone should have been more um, transparent at that time to indicate that there was, in fact, a, another issue that was driving how this came before the Long Range Planning Committee. Now, this is not a knock on the committee. They do great work. They're part of our process, and it fits in very well with what we ask them to do. Uh, they, they develop language. It goes into the, you know, into the planning board and on through the process before it comes to this point now before the council. But I, I think we just need to do a better job of being honest and transparent. I, that could have helped all of us along the way, I think, as counselors, and I think it would also have helped the public to socialize it over a longer period of time. And I don't believe it would necessarily have put in jeopardy any pending, um, you know, sale, purchase and sale agreement. So that that's kind of, it's a little bit out of left field, but <clears throat> that I know uh, is a source of frustration and is a source of, of trust, a mistrust. Um, you know, often on the part of, of the public. Can I just respond to the timeline? Yeah. I, I just want to be clear. This okay. was heard uh, in October of 19, 2019 by the Long Range Planning. We didn't go into contract until the following month. So oh. when it was initially yeah. brought forward, it was not known. We didn't have a contract. Secondarily, I would simply submit that Long Range Planning, I'm interested in their uh, unabashed, un uninfluenced opinion about whether the zone chain makes sense. So I'm not sure 
it was not purposefully withheld. In fact, I, I could argue, I think successfully, that it's good for them to give their honest, open opinion regardless of right. any motivation. And if I just may respond to that. This could be part of my own uh, feeling of being the only dunce in the room who didn't know about it. Okay, so that's maybe <laughs> my bad here. Uh, but <laughs> I have a similar twinge when I hear uh, the explanation that we're really just trying to, you know, do a little cleanup here. You know, well, that, I, I think, is that really the reason? If there's another reason, let's talk about it and be transparent about it and get it out there and let's work it through the process. Well, Can Councilor Johnson. I have a comment on this. Could you blow that map back a little bit and somebody just show me where Ward Street is in relationship to this building? It's actually off this map. Um, it would be the next one over. It does connect, though? Does it connect? No, no. 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 We're, that's we're the issue. Independent from you can't get Libby. to the light. Can't get to the light. You cannot get to the light. You can get to Route One, though. Is that correct? Get to Route One. You can get to Black Point, but you have to turn left out of Black Point if right. you're going from this neighborhood. Well, I mean, it, it's more of a general comment because you know, on Ward Street, Eastern Village is opening up Ward Street right. as another access mm -hmm. for well, the village, which right. is going to have hundreds of units down there. And I was just wondering, with the I was with the initial public hearing on this, and the main concern was the traffic and. Especially, we know we're going to close up those curb stops on Route 1, so the entrance is probably going to be, what, down Fairfield and the road on the other side. So what are we telling the folks when they express these concerns? What, what are we going to do about this traffic? Because this isn't the end of it. That's 24 units and maybe a small restaurant. But right. North Village is coming in with 86 more units that's going to spill out into the same area, maybe not right down the same road, but all converging into Route 1. Is there a... And Sawyer? I know we like to say, you know, the planning board will take care of it. Right. <laughs> You're going to be no. busy. I just <laughs> like to be able to tell the people oh, something when they ask about this. What about the traffic? The reality is there's no simple solutions for Oak Hill Intersection. We have studied it for 30 years, right. and there's, there's simply not sufficient real estate uh, to move extra lanes through that intersection. Sure. Uh, 20 years ago or so, the council maybe took right. a definitive action there was a proposal, I think as part of the Eastern Village initial conversation about funneling traffic coming up Black Point Road, kind of around Oak Hill, uh, so-called jug handles. Right and there. the council took a very conscious uh, action, a decisive decision to say, no, we, don't, yeah. we do not want to do that. We will continue to rely on the existing roadway systems. So okay, I but I think you can see the concern is the, uh, the congestion oh, up on Route 1, which should be really in our decisioning making about opening up Wood Street to come in to Route 1 on top of this. So somewhere along the line of the process, whether it be through planning or site plan review or whatever, we we should be able to say no at some times. It's the end of my comment. Thank you. Councilor Gleisting? Uh, yeah, so I did, I want to address a, a couple of points um, about who attended the meetings. The um, the notices to the neighbors went out in a 250 foot range um, notification for the neighbors meeting. Um, the, the planning board will send out 500 feet notification. So that's going to get a larger group mm -hmm. of residents um, notified. And um, I, I do appreciate that I use the term buffering, which I don't think is, was a good term to use uh, because uh, by buffering, I was, uh, using a term that more meant, uh, you know, if you're right next to an R4 on an, and an R4. Um, but I meant in terms of what, could, what the actual uses are for R4 versus what the uses will be for, for TVC. And, you know, I would like to say that I, I think this, it does, it, it does all, all come together because uh, in terms of us selling this property, because if we had made this change before, um, in terms of changing this uh, to TVC so that the whole thing was TVC. And then we got the disposition, you know, we started to sell the property. Um, I think if we look at the policy about um, how we sell property by the town, there probably would have been a lot of other feedback into that, that process 
uh, based on even our own policy of who, who's going to look, who's going to uh, be consulted in the process of what we're going to do, all the way down to the fact that, you know, the, the policy itself says that we can um, put deed restrictions and covenants. So to Councillor um, Ken Johnson's points, um, you know, the only thing we can do about Route 1 is stop putting so many, so much new development um, right in that area um, in terms of at least for the property we as the town sell, um, you know, once, once something is zoned, uh, but we, we certainly could put contingencies in and things like that. We have, uh, we have that right, deed restrictions, covenants. Um, if we had even already rezoned this, I think the conversation would have been different when we went to even sell, sell the property. Um, because what, what is a good use for that? For that? Uh, so we're, here we are at the rezoning instead, and I still just come back to what protects the, the neighborhoods there. And you can just see it's quite an extensive neighborhood. It's a well-established neighborhood, is to not rezone this to TBC. It's to keep it R4. Just to, if I could, I want to be clear on the, the history of this matter. Uh, the ad hoc police, uh, police building committee, uh, Councilor Hayes was on that in the early mm -hmm. days. Uh, among my, uh, many things, they were charged and tasked with looking at potential reuses of that site. And we did follow the policy. I can provide you all the documentation. Uh, there was a conscious effort by the council at the time, at the conclusion of that evaluation, to not deed restrict and to maximize the sale value. And so we went through a simple conventional real estate listing as opposed to an RFP process or some other process that potentially would have minimized uh, the, the value, if you will. Yeah. So uh, your point's well taken. I just want to be sure that the record's clear that those yeah. points were considered and decided against. Councilor Clucci? Yeah, I, I mean, looking at the map, to me, it, it, it's intuitive. It makes a lot of sense. I want to understand what the planning board has to say about it and what the public obviously has to say about it. Um, but it, on the surface, it, it looks like it makes sense. And I, I did just want to comment that uh, we recently installed uh, smart traffic lights at Dunstan Corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, some traffic committee meetings this summer, it was talked about that this might be a, um, a viable candidate. That might be something that helps to ease some of the traffic concerns as well. I just wanted to, that there are some options that can still be looked at, including closing the curb cuts um, on Route 1. Which, oh, I'm sorry, can I just add yep. one thing yep. on that? So one of the things the, the residents did say is they weren't as opposed to the, this building going more towards Route 1. It, it's the part we're looking at rezoning. That's the part that they were not as in favor of. So they were saying, well, you know, if it goes out by Route 1, where it's in the TBC, they were not as opposed to that. Um, and I think the curb cuts are open to discussion still. That's... You know, the right, it, yeah, the developer heard loud and clear that they weren't in favor of cutting out curb points because their concern is, especially with a restaurant, you're just going to be funneling all the traffic right down their two streets. So that would be a huge concern. Um, it came up with how we don't have enough parking for the Nonsuch Brewery, how that went through the planning board process somehow, and we're, we're parking on 114. So they're very sensitive to, you know, that traffic will go down their streets, even if we say it's no parking. Um, and if you do curb cuts, you know, you're make, and making blocking for where are people going to come out. So, you know, that would still be open. And the developer made it clear he would be listening um, to that kind of input. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I guess, you know, kind of building on the earlier conversation, but what this feels like to me, I'm somewhat uncomfortable that this is in front of us right now, and we don't seem to have a lot of answers. I mean, I think the answers of around, gee, what what might be going in there? What's it going to look like? What are we going to do about traffic? I mean, I I come down from Topsom every day to Scarborough. I'm down off, you know, Winnix Neck Road. I usually come through there at six. I came through there at five last night. It took me ten minutes. I went through three cycles of traffic lights at Hannaford Drive, a couple cycles of traffic lights at Oak Hill just to turn left. The traffic is an issue. And we have got WEX coming, we've got the Downs additional units coming. So I think, you know, and, and we can't give answers to that community, those residential areas. I just feel like this might be the right answer. It might make a lot of sense to do. I just think we're a little early in the process. I'm getting to feel like 
things are coming in front of us that aren't fully sort of vetted and baked and answered. So I'm sort of uncomfortable tonight moving forward with this without going back to the community and answering some of the questions that we've just had as, as a group. So I, I, won't be, I won't be supporting it tonight, but that's just one vote. Councilor Catherine. Uh, I would remind the council that this is first reading. It does have to go before the planning board. Um, so I would encourage people to at least move it to the planning board and let them take a look at this and come back. Any more? Yeah, so I guess I'd built, uh, I think Don hit it, uh, Councilor Hamill hit it, said it best when he said it's a small miracle that this is still our, our four. I mean, if, when you just look at the map, so to speak. Uh, I don't think there's a, I, I think what's going there will be great, and, but I don't think that there's going to be a whole lot of winners as it stands right now. It, that is a complex intersection and a huge source of frustration, and I think that we need to be mindful going forward that um, this, 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 is a, this puzzle is nowhere close to solved. Um, however, with that being said, I will say that I'm going to excuse Councillor Johnson and Gleistein for my comments, but we voted to go on a contract with this contingency. Um, so we've been well aware of this since we voted to go on a contract. Uh, so I, there's some ownership there as a council that I think we need to start taking. Uh, and I, I think sometimes that we don't, and this isn't directed at, by the way, Peter, this is not directed <laughs> at you. I know this might sound like it's directed at you, but it's not. I, I just, I need to reckon, I think it's important that we reconcile sometimes that we took an action and here we are now as a result of that action. Uh, so to me, the best mindset we can be in is how are we going to make this work? Because we chose to go forward with this. I mean, this is a over a million dollar transaction um, that is contingent on a lot of things. And um, we had a very clear piece of paper in front of us on possibilities and contingencies, and we, 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 we did it. And so I think we need to own it, and I don't think it's going to be pretty. I think that the residents have plenty to worry about with this. I, you know, I mean, this is, this is going to be difficult, but the best thing we can do is try to bring everybody together and see, see if we can get something that works for everybody. So, yep. Yeah. 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 Just kind of counter. I'm, I hear you yeah. and I understand your point. I'm just saying, I think before we move on this, we could have done a little bit more of answering some of those questions. So, yeah. you yeah. know, saying it's going to be bad is not exactly the great answer to the, to the community. So, I'm only concerned about the timing and the process sure. of where yeah. we are tonight. Right. I just think we need a look. Could have been a workshop issue. Sure. I think and it still so might be. That's what, I mean, it just needs to get to the planning board somehow. Well, so I, 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 yeah, I think clearly it should be a workshop issue. I think we can, I can fully agree with you on that. It, frankly, my fear is that the answers to the questions we don't have. And I don't believe the developer is going to make much further investment until they know they can, the project's viable. That's so it, there's a bit of a, Catch 22. Uh, we would provide the answers if we had them. We simply don't. Council Garcia. Yeah, and I just, I just wanted to add. I mean, you're right. Ken and I were not on the council at that point. We'd been elected, but not sworn in. Um, so I can't speak to who knew what. But I know that night, uh, which was November 6, there was an executive session to discuss this contract, and then it was brought forward with the second reading waived. So um, I, I see that as. Yeah, you, there was a decision made, but sometimes as you start looking at all the ramifications and have the, the zoning change right in front of you, um, then I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to go forward um, with, you know, a certain decision that led to other decisions. So I think it was, it was, uh, it was, it was brought up, it was done, uh, through a long planning process in terms of, as uh, Tom pointed out, which I'm well aware of, that the Public Safety uh, Committee talked about selling the building. They didn't talk about what it would be sold for, uh, but, but that it should be sold. Um, and there was, there was mostly talk that it was probably going to be a restaurant. Um, that was the most common talk, as I recall. Um, and there was one public comment uh, uh, during the public meetings to not sell the building. Um, that was the only public comment I could find about that to not sell the property. So um, I do think it was it was it was uh, it was done done pretty quickly without a lot of public input. So that's just my comment. Any more? 
Yeah. I mean, I just would put forward to anyone who is like, well, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should change our plans. Maybe we should, you know, if, if we don't do this, you're not going to have a contract here anymore, so you're not going to have $1.4 million. I just want people to think about, so how are you going to raise that amount of money for public safety? That's my only comment at this point. Well, there were eight offers. That's all right? I asked. All right, I'm going to take a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Five to two. Uh, moving on, order number 20028, first reading, and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments for Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance. And I'll let Tom slash yes, Jay. Yes, um, I'm going to quickly pivot to Jay, but this is the companion piece. Uh, this actually, uh, as Long Range took this matter up, uh, they actually considered and, and thought it best to actually do a couple of slight uh, modifications to the TVC zone. And so this is really a companion to the zone change, independent of, but um, coming to you at the same time. I'll let Jay talk about the particulars. Sure. Yeah, that's, um, thank you, Tom. Um, as Tom just mentioned, essentially when, when these type of items come before the Long Range Planning Committee, we like to open up not only the map, but look at the language in the ordinance as well and see what else is going on. Um, and so really as part of that process, there were three sort of main elements that sort of maybe jumped off the page or came up in discussion anyway um, in terms of considerations in the zoning ordinance. We're now away from the map and we're really talking about the language in the zoning ordinance. Um, and so um, two of them are really focused on the TVC and really the, not only TVC, but how it uh, uh, coordinates with the TVC2 and the TVC3. Um, and just sort of for a broader uh, context, the TVC, the TVC is our town village center. The TVC2 and 3 are sort of transition uh, zones that are, are designed to support the overall TVC. So um, with that as a quick way of backdrop and background, um, one of the first elements that are being proposed uh, uh, for consideration is a discrepancy um, with how multi-building developments are considered in the TVCs, that would be all, you know, TVC and 2 and 3. Um, essentially what the TVC 2 and TVC 3 say is when you have a multi-building um, development, and this is on one parcel, that the principal building needs to meet the, the setbacks to, the, to the, the front yard setbacks. And I will say in our TVC zones, we have a minimum front yard and a maximum front yard. So there's really sort of this band, if you will, that a building needs to at least sit in. Um, and so, um, again, in the TVC 2 and 3, it says the principal building needs to sort of fit in that band. And then if there's multiple buildings, if the lot happens to be big enough, that those other buildings can be oriented um, elsewhere on the site, given all the other sort of site plan um, elements that the planning board reviews in terms of orientation and buffering and circulation and those sorts of things. In the TVC, the current language says that all buildings need to meet that front yard setback. That becomes uh, tricky depending on the characteristics of a lot. Sometimes lots have small, have narrow frontage and widen up out back per se. Um, and you know, it just doesn't necessarily lend itself for um, sort of more flexible um, uh, orientation and site design based on sort of all those other standards we had talked about. So the, the consideration is really to, to marry, to, to match what's happening in the TVC2 and TVC3 with what would be happening in the TVC for multi-building um, developments. The other item that uh, was identified, looking at the permitted uses, um, there's, there's subtle differences, differences between the TVC and TVC 2 and 3. They're all mixed use um, developments, all allow some forms of residential. Um, the TVC doesn't allow single family say. TVC 2 and 3 do, but not on certain street frontages. So again, there's, um, they all allow for multi-family uh, developments um, in terms of residential. 
But then when you start to look at the mix, uh, uh, the commercial uses, uh, largely they sort of mimic each other in a lot of ways. Um, but one of the things that was identified that in the TVC2 and TVC3, again, sort of the support zones, we allow for hotels and motels. The TVC currently does not allow for hotels and motels. Um, so we just thought that it may make sense to allow hotels and motels in what is otherwise the more intensive zone, the TVC, um, since we allow it in the TVC2 and TVC3. Then the third element, um, and this really touches sort of more, uh, has more tentacles into the zoning ordinance, if you will, and it's really how we treat and talk about building height in the zoning ordinance. And we really talk about building height in a couple of different ways, and so we really want to try to, and that's caused some confusion in the past, so we really want to try to codify how that's done and simplify. And as I said, there's really two different categories we have here. One is our, our, our residential, our low to moderate uh, uh, density residential zones, the RFs, the R2, R3, R4, um, and the like have in their space and bulk standards, this is where you talk about setbacks and building heights and those <laughs> sorts of things. It says for maximum building height, it refers you back to the performance standards in the, in the zoning order. So you have to flip some hundred pages back to come to one little sentence that says uh, build, uh, dwellings of 35 feet. Well, why did I have to flip back when I could have just said building height of 35 feet? So the proposal is to simply do that. The other piece is in our more contemporary zones, and now we're talking about the TVC, TVC 2, 3, Higgis Parkway, um, RH2, crossroad zones. We have a statement in some of those zones that says, okay, well, the maximum building height is either, and I, I think in your packet I gave an example here, using the TVC 2 as the example, three stories or 45 feet. And the word or is pretty important when it comes to zoning ordinance because that means dealer's choice. <laughs> so um, someone could conceivably build a 50-story, 50 50-foot, 50 three-story building um, rather than just having it be a 45-foot building. So um, that's caused some confusion, and so the thought is let's just say the maximum number of feet that are allowed and not sort of talk about stories or feet and just go with feet. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, the uh, intensity of uses uh, on a site are governed through our, you know, net residential density calculations if we're talking about residential uses or um, otherwise carrying capacity in terms of traffic, parking, stormwater, buffering, and all those other elements. Um, so um, as we looked at it, we thought that might be a, a way to um, just sort of alleviate any confusion or potential um, uh, 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 conflicts with what we might not have otherwise seen coming. So those are what I've got for you. Any questions for Jay? Councilor Hayes? Yeah, can you, can you maybe go back to the original rationale? Why was there a difference between TC and TC? TVC, TVC. TVC, yep. I mean, clearly yep. there was that decision made on a rational basis if there were differences. Yep. Um, and it, it's really about the transition um, where the TVC is really seen as being sort of the core and the more dense and intensive uses. And you'll notice when you look at the TVC 2s and 3s, the intensity of uses and the uh, size allowance for certain developments are sort of um, narrow down, if you will. A good example would be in the TVC, we allow retail uses. Um, but the TVC three, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I added the three there. We allow retail uses, but only a maximum of a thousand square feet. So the TVC three is really intended to service principally the residences in and around that zone. Where the TVC two starts to get a little bigger, you can start to get into 5,000 square foot retail uses. Um, in other type of uses as well, but I'm using that as an example. So um, the the marketplace, if you will, gets a little bigger, and TVC zones are really intended to sort of be, you know, downtown, regional type um, um, zoning. So, so why were the setbacks different originally? Why was hotels in one but not the other? 
I mean, there had to be some rationale for or thought process. Um, yeah, the hotel motel one, Karen and I can't quite figure out. Um, so don't, don't know the answer to that one. The, the, the setback piece, the multi-building setback yeah. piece, I was able to sort of go, so the TVC zone has been around for quite some time in our ordinance, actually dating back to the 90s, uh, 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 pre, predates our 2006 comprehensive plan, which is when the TVC 2 and 3 came around. Um, and so that language seems to have um, been integrated earlier and not necessarily for whatever reason wasn't reconsidered when T TVC 2 and 3 were adopted. Um, for whatever reason, I can't speak to what the, the rationale was at the time, but in looking at it now, it seems to make made sense to the Long Range Planning Committee to look at um, complementing that in the TBC. Just, just a follow up question. Yeah, sure. And it, and it really relates back to the prior one. I've heard mentioned three or four times tonight, consistent with the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Which comprehensive plan are we referring to? Because the, the current one is what, it's about a year overdue. We haven't seen it so i'm assuming when we say it's consistent with the comprehensive plan we're talking about the existing one which is which is dated the the, the 2006 comprehensive plan that's right it um i will note and as um you know those who have sort of followed the 2020 comprehensive plan that the long-range planning committee is taking up hopefully friday and you'll be seeing very soon really mimics land use um it, it from the 2006 in terms of where growth is identified to be directed towards I think you know the, this update to the comprehensive plan has really been talked about looking at sort of the systems that go into um, uh, growth management in terms of how, how does traffic and affordable housing and uh, natural uh, resource preservation and how do all these elements integrate where sort of um, past plans typically silo these type of things. Um, this plan is aimed a little bit more at trying to look at a more holistic picture. So why wouldn't we wait for this, mm -hmm. these changes, until we saw that comprehensive plan? I mean, you've probably yep. seen parts of it, but are, is yep. there anything in there that would inform about where, would it inform this decision? Um, I would think it would support the decision. The, the, the comprehensive plan doesn't give specific directives in terms of ordinance changes that are this no, sort of density this. and use and yep and so the the 2020 comprehensive plan certainly talks about looking at intensifying uses in our growth areas um so you know i do think that these changes would be consistent with that 2020 plan as currently drafted of course that needs to go through a, pro a process but um so then specifically yep. as it relates to the public safety building this would mean the height would change if it got rezoned it would change from 35 feet to 45 feet right no i thought i thought you said you were trying to move the tvc to 45 feet nope nope no? so okay. so again in the packet it's the 35 feet and we can look through it right now the way it reads in the tvc in the TVC, it says the minimum, the maximum building height, this is where it says three stories or 45 feet. This is where you could get into that scenario where someone could potentially build a 50-foot three-story building. So by going to just the 45 feet, so we're not changing the proposal that's before you does not change any of the existing height in terms of feet. It, we're simply labeling it in terms of feet rather than specifying stories. And it gets to that terminology of or, which again, um, sort of leaves the window a bit open. But going, I hope from, our, but going from R4 to TVC does change it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sir, yeah, 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 yep. I didn't. Councilor Hamill? Yeah, I, a quick question. It's related to the, to the building height and stories language that yeah. was stricken. So in uh, the Haggis Parkway District, we have some space and bulk standards. Uh, it used to be 75 feet high, not to exceed six stories, and mm -hmm. then 45 feet, not to exceed three stories. Does that mean now you could build a 45, up to a 45 foot high building, or up to a 75 foot building? Why is the need for, for, for both of those numbers now? Shouldn't it just be 75 feet? 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm you know. Yep, you'll, you have to excuse me. I'm going to grab the book. And sorry. And while you're looking, it's just sort of a, can someone build a 45-foot building that had four stories? I mean, I don't know what standard heights are for. Yeah. Is that? 10-foot ceilings, yeah. Is that possible? Yeah. A four-story. Could build a four-story, 45-foot yeah. building. Yeah. Wouldn't be pretty, but anyway. That was the only question I had. Thanks. But I, I sat through the discussion of the height and stories in, at the Long Range Planning Committee, and I, I found it interesting. But I, I wasn't able to conclude yep. the, it, it, the and, distinction. And I can, to your question as to the, the 75 and 45, yep. there's another column that fell off. Okay. And so um, what the under the maximum building height, it's non-residential and mixed uses are allowed at up to 75 residential uses are allowed up to 45 Great. so there's just a column that fell thank off you. so that's the difference there thank you sorry about that Councilor Gleisen so my question is similar along these lines um, so why why weren't you proposing to to leave the stories in but then um, provided they do not exceed the height restrictions so that would that would take care of it right as opposed to or but if we wanted to say, okay, in this zone, we really don't want more than three stories because that could lead to more density or, or whatever, we could take care of the or by saying, provided they do not exceed X feet in height, right? Which we have that language throughout the ordinance, throughout 405. Provided they don't exceed X feet or you mean X Provided stories. they don't, nope. So yeah. we stick with the stories uh -huh. and then we say, so with, provided it does not exceed oh, right. yeah. 45 feet or provided it does not ex exceed. So that way we yeah. were kind of sticking with the spirit of what was originally mm -hmm. in the ordinance and presumably was worked for quite some time by the, the people who worked it in the past in terms of stories. Mm -hmm. um, but we make sure that we've made it clear. Yeah, um, that could be one approach. I know when we talked with the long range planning committee, it was really about um, thinking about the intensity of use of, of a site really being governed by the things I sort of mentioned before um, in terms of net residential density that sort of tells you how many units are possible regardless of stories um, and then as well as you know future development being governed by the amount of parking that needs to be on site the storm water so those type of things but, right and um, that applies that, to TBC as well the all, all commercial and subdivision goes through that. Have all that, process. so they, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilor Johnson. I have a question, Jay. I'm sorry, it sounded like there was a lot of change in there. Did we just, was that just one order? I'm sorry. Yeah, it does read like three. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can we go back to the setback part? Which I sure. The very mm -hmm. first part yeah. where each building is, has a minimum setback of the roadway. Yeah, so the way uh, the TV, the way the ordinance reads um, in a number of our more contemporary zones that really try to create sort of a, um, a relationship between the building and the street, we have a minimum setback. So it says a building must be set back at least, I'll just use 10 feet, but then a maximum setback of no more than 25 feet. So you have this 15 foot wide band. Now the whole building doesn't need to be in there, but just sort of the front, that, that's where the building needs to start. Um, so if you drive down Route 1 right here from the building, you'll see that consistent pattern with all businesses, right? From Dunkin' Donuts to the... Um, I don't know if Dunkin' Donuts, I guess I'd have to take a look typically. Well, um, just an illustrative point. Yeah. I mean, it seems like they've right. had everybody set, uh, set up. Mm -hmm. So I, I was just wondering what's driving, because I think the change mm -hmm. is to disallow that and have clusters of buildings not meeting that minimum set or maximum setback. Is that correct? Clusters of buildings. So it's, again, this would be a, an example of a site, one site that has multiple buildings on it um, that, um, provides a little more flexibility in terms of site design. Um, again, sometimes site characteristics, whether they have a narrow frontage, um, what, um, you know, any other natural characteristics, if there's some wetlands you're trying to work around, whatever the case may be, um, it provides a little more flexibility in terms of enabling the orientation of, of the other buildings um, 
to be situated on the site that might allow for better circulation through a site, potentially better buffering, better stormwater management design, parking layout, what, what have you. Um, excuse me? No, no, doesn't, doesn't increase the density necessarily. Uh, but for potentially, uh, I guess, it, in one regards that if, a, if the lot has narrow frontage and sort of has back uh, area out back, say, they wouldn't be able to get multiple buildings. So I guess in, in that way it might govern density, but in terms of net residential density, the calculation would still be the same if we're talking residential. Commercial uses could still be, you know, they could just do potentially a bigger building uh, out front. So. How did the setback one come to you or come, how did that get uh, brought forward? It was just part of, part of the due diligence and looking at the ordinance and sort of seeing what's happening out there and what the differences are. So I, I, I guess there isn't a specific targeted aha, uh -huh, if you know what I mean. It's just working with the ordinance for years. And, there's things that you sort of identify and say, oh, let's put a flag next to that one, and oh, hey, we're talking about this. Let's see how that incorporates. Because I was listening to a past planning board meeting, so I'm going out on a limb yep. here to make myself look like an idiot, but um, there, when the Downs was bringing forward um, phase two, there was discussion about setbacks in terms of the garage from the road. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain that at all, or? This wouldn't have anything wouldn't, to do with that. Wouldn't have so anything I'm, to do with I, that, so. I'd be happy to talk with you about that, yeah. but I don't feel like I have, <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> this, yeah. This, this would not impact that. This is only for, just keep in mind, this would only be a change in the TVC to mimic what's happening in the TVC 2 and TVC gotcha. 3. It's not about other zones. Jake, I have a question. To, actually, I'm gonna piggyback on Gly, Councilor Glycine's might look like an idiot because I have the same type of question. So <laughs> um, if we look at, you took an example of TVC2 as the, going back to the logical and versus the logical or, because right now you have a logical yep. or. I, Councilor Gleistein suggested why is it a logical Just and. The and yeah, sure. correct. Um, and, and so I'm going to address something that I think might be in people's heads. When we look at something like the public safety building, we're looking at compact living spaces. Is, is that, is, is something like that, right? Workforce housing that I mm -hmm. believe is smaller. I, does height play into in, into how much does height play into that one? So I guess my I, back to the question of can we get four stories of that type of housing in 45 feet? Because yeah. I guess what we're all in the back of our head, I'm just going to say it, is I think that we're worried that, okay, is this going to allow a 20 unit building at mm -hmm. Oak Hill turn into a 35 unit building at Oak Hill? So can you address that? Yeah, I can. Okay. All right. Net, and and I've, I've used the term, and I'm sorry I haven't really articulated what the term is because I live it and I understand yep. others don't, right? So the, the, the term is net residential density. Hmm. Essentially what that is is every property that has that residential uses are allowed on, and that could be in our, you know, just residential zones or our mixed use zones. Every property, um, every zone talks about how much density per acre is allowed. So if you're allowed four units per acre, say, what a developer does when they come to the planning board is they do their net residential calculations. So they take their gross area of lot area, their surveyor goes out and does their thing. Then there's certain elements that have to be subtracted out to get to their net residential area. You know, we're talking typically wetlands, any rights of way, any existing stormwater facilities, um, these sorts of things, and there's and there's also just a baseline. Ten percent is taken off for infrastructure uh, considerations. That gets them to from their gross. You subtract out. You're now down to your net residential area, and based on then you take your your density allowance. If it's four units per acre, say, you then say okay, four times whatever I have left is my density. So. Whatever density is allowed, again, use, let's use the public safety building. If it were all TVC zoned, um, whatever number of units are allowed there would be allowed there sort of if, regardless if it was a uh, maximum of one story or maximum of eight stories. You could only get so many units on the lot. That was, thank you. That was for, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Similar question. 
if you have parking on the first floor and then three stories, would that be considered a three story or a four story? Uh, the that would be considered uh, four stories, I believe, because you start the. I don't have my books. With you. Okay. Yeah, right. but you start you start the. Not that important, but yeah. I was trying to draw a correlate, maybe right. see if they're really more similar than I think we were <laughs> yep. anticipating. Any more for Jay? Councilor Caterina? Actually, this isn't for Jay. All right. Uh, just a reminder, this is the first reading that's going to planning. Well, any more so, for Jay? Wait, wait for Jay. So, <laughs> anyway. I'm just. <laughs> I just have uh, one question, maybe to help clarify. Jay, is it fair to characterize that the setback set of changes you're proposing mm. in the height are things that you have dealt with through the years and have been question marks that yeah, yeah. I think you said put a flag in it that when we have a chance we ought to clarify these things. Yeah. Is that fair? Yep. Whereas with the hotel motel, is that here before us because of any particular request from the developer? Nope. That was actually one that not, you know Karen yeah. identified as we were doing our process getting ready for long range planning. She said, hey look at this. Isn't that funny? I said, oh, that is kind of funny. Let's talk to the long range planning committee and see what they think. So I, I was just trying to characterize yep. kind of the nature of these changes mm -hmm. and how they find themselves mm -hmm. before you. Thank you, Jay. Yep. Is there a motion on the table? Double. Second. Discussion? Councilor Gleising? Uh, yeah, th these are very tough. Um, you know, I'd like to make a, a pitch that long range planning should be recorded um, so that you can go back and. Um, understand a lot of what's being uh, discussed and, and uh, driven through that particular committee um, because it, it's clearly very important. Um, and, you know, uh, it's interesting that TVC2 and TVC3 are offering hotels um, because TVC, with the way Jay, they quoted it to us, you know, the use for TVC, um, you know, it, it clearly says it's it's for resident intended for intended for residents you know it's intended to be for residents of the immediate region and hotels you know are not really for residents for the immediate reason region i guess although unless you put your family in a hotel because you can't you can't stand them staying with you or you don't have enough room at your house because you live in um a workforce housing so um anyway uh the uh you know, I'm comfortable without hotels being in TVC based on what we say the use is TVC. Um, I, again, this is very difficult for me because this is so much and um, clearly there's just hours of long range planning committee that I would listen to a lot of the meetings if we had them because a lot of the uh, discussion is, is in those. Council Kluge? Uh so I feel like sometimes we try to be so specific with what's with our zoning that we really make it difficult for something creative to come or happen around us. And it's not easy to, I mean, these details just, they drive me nuts. Like we can't even answer what a three story building is without having to refer to, refer to a 500 page manual. It, uh, so somebody trying to do something with their property, it's, it's difficult, it's confusing. You need five experts to, to figure it out. So I guess that's, I just wanted to point out that's kind of generally where I am with zoning. So I don't have a problem with any of these changes. I want people to come to town and try to do cool stuff with their properties. And let's make reasonable decisions about whether we want that here or not. So. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would echo is, I, my understanding is some of this is from long range planning, some of it's from staff, but I, I, I just echo, I think, especially when you're new to the council, long-range planning committee seems to be something that's over there and we're not engaged with it and they do do a lot of work. So anything we can do, and I, I obviously I know that we have liaisons to it, and but it does seem like sometimes a mystery body to us and that's on us, I think, sometimes. But I think we could all work together to see if we, there's a way we can have more exposure to what they're talking about because it would certainly help us. Yeah, I guess where I am, and it sort of echoes of the previous one, I'm just somewhat uncomfortable with the volume of these couple of changes in front of us, the timing of them. It really, I, I think there's a growing sentiment, at least what I'm hearing is, you know, do we have a plan for growth and, and what is happening with growth and the pace of growth? And are we really thinking about how growth is going to impact, as we have just said, if we can't fix Oak Hill, um, 
And, and so it feels like we're approaching these things kind of piecemeal and not necessarily in a comprehensive strategic way. I mean, we've invested a ton of money in a new comprehensive plan, and here we are making changes before at least we have seen the comprehensive plan. I would be much more comfortable with these things being in front of us in sort of a sequenced, orderly way once we have that. So I'm I, I don't see a pressing need. It doesn't sound like there's any pressure from any development right in front of us, because you just answered there isn't. Um, so I'm uncomfortable doing this in this process. I would rather slow this down. I'd rather work on the growth organs, get a better feel to, to answer some of the questions here. What do we want in this town? And where do we want it? And what do we want it to look like? Um, so I, I, I'm going to vote no. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think we're ready for prime time yet on this. Um, so that's, that's just where I am. OK. Uh, with that, all those in favor? All those opposed? Four, three. And I am going to take a brief recess. We'll reconvene at 8.57. <laughs> <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs>
Okay, we are back in session. Uh, we are on order number 20029. First reading, I refer to the planning board, the proposed <coughs> amendments to chapter 405, the town of Scarborough zoning ordinance, section 7HB, historic preservation. Jay again. Oh, hey, Jay. Jay. <laughs> You're the man. I didn't see you show up. <laughs> At the risk of wearing out my welcome. Um, Let's see, so this is actually coming to you by way of the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, so I guess I have the uh, lucky instance to present it to you. Um, so the Historic Preservation uh, Implementation Committee actually started looking at a number of years ago, uh, the town adopted our Historic Preservation Ordinance or component to our zoning ordinance that listed, I believe it's 48 properties. Um, the implementation committee has gone back and, and um, taken a, a second look at that list and identified a number of uh, sort of really three categories of changes that they would like uh, the council to consider. Um, the first are three are really just around um, address changes, sort of um, areas that were uh, labeled, mis, mis, uh, mislabeled either through their address or their map and lot. Um, then there are four other properties that are actually proposed to be removed from, from the list, um, either uh, for different reasons. One can't really be found. One, the structure has been completely altered and has no uh, historic value uh, any longer. Actually, I think that might be two of them. Um, other ones, just a misidentified uh, property. And then there are two new additions, um, and these are um, along the Honeywell Road. These are sort of known as Honeywell Houses. Um, and so um, those are proposed to be added to the list. Um, about 10 months ago or so, uh, I helped the Historic Preservation Commission put together a mailing to all the impacted properties to let them know of the proposed changes. Um, I believe a few of those folks did have opportunity to come meet with the with the Historic Preservation Committee. I, I go to their meetings occasionally um, when, when requested. Um, I wasn't there for those meetings, but it sounded like particularly the two that are being added, I think, you know, have been part of those conversations. Um, and I think that's probably where the most significant impact is. I will, I should, again, just by way of background, again, um, knowing that uh, you all aren't reading every single page of the zoning ordinance every single day. Um, the Historic Preservation or uh, provision of our ordinance is really an incentive-based provision. It enables folks who have these properties to potentially do things with their property. Um, it incentivizes maintaining the historic nature of the property. Um, it provides for potential density bonuses in some instances if there's other development capacity on the lot. And the other thing it does, it allows for some relief from current building codes, um, and this is sort of uh, laid out in sort of state language, um, so that you can maintain the overall character of the property, uh, of the structure, I should say. Um, so again, as I said, it's an incentive-laden um, program, and I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Any questions for Jay? Councilor Caterina? Um, this isn't a question, I just want to add, I'm the representative to Historic Preservation um, and liaison, I should say. And um, yeah, they've been doing a lot of work on this to clean this up. They've been, uh, Jessica Holbrook, who was a former chair of the town council, really, she's been to every property, uh, tracked them down, looked up, found out what was going on. As regards the ones to be added, the uh, owners did come to a meeting and they were very excited about being added to the list. And just for, so the public knows, um, being on this list, as Jay indicated, is helpful to owners. I know people sometimes see historic designations and they think, oh no, like Portland, I have to get permission before I can change windows or do this or do that. It's not like that at all. Uh, it's more, it is an incentive to try to help people to maintain uh, some of the uh, exterior architecture, I can't even talk, architectural character or, or whatnot to these buildings. So. Councilor Clucci? Uh, that sort of answers my question. I, I was curious about the ones coming off the list, if, if there was a reason, and, and maybe the incentives didn't make <laughs> sense to them. Um, 
So I was just wondering if there was an opportunity there that something that was historic in nature could have been possibly preserved. Yeah, and I think that's what we have just again for council's uh, knowledge what we have in our system is um, a, a, a check if you will on the properties that are on the list and so that when a property owner comes forward and, and puts in a permit we take a moment to pause and just say do you know are you aware that your property is on this list and here's what here's what that means that you have an, a his you know a, one of the few properties in town that have historic value and here's some things that you might be able to do to preserve that historic uh, uh, character of the property um, so um, I don't think I answered your question maybe <laughs> any more questions for Jay all right Jay see you in a couple seconds yes you will. <laughs> is there a motion on the table so moved second discussion what about public comment no I'm sorry. Is there public comment? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, moving on to order number 20030. First reading and refer to planning board the proposed amendments to chapter 405C, the Scarborough, excuse me, the town of Scarborough shoreline ordinance. That's Brian. <laughs> Okay, a little break. No, my mistake. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's done a good job, but I'll give him a little break. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know how much um, you all know about our shoreland zoning and why we have it and, and everything, so I'll just give you the real quick elevator speech, and, and then hopefully my memo outlines some of the changes, and then I really due to the lateness of the hour, prefer that you ask me questions that you have them rather than just have me talk at you. But we do have a mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act in the state of Maine, so all municipalities have to adopt an ordinance that is consistent with the state guidelines. Periodically, the state updates their guidelines and towns are obligated to update their ordinance accordingly. The last set of guidelines was developed in 2015. Um, a handful of communities have adopted them. I think several more communities have not. We were told probably a year and a half ago that the Attorney General's office would soon be sending out nasty letters to communi communities <laughs> telling them that you need to update your ordinance to get it consistent with our guidelines. So in, in um, anticipation of that, I started crafting our ordinance and in, in the amendments to, to make it consistent with that. Um, the guidelines that uh, from 2015 have some good things in it. Um, they also have some things I don't particularly like, but we are still obligated to be no less restrictive, no less restrictive than the state guidelines. We can be more restrictive if we want to. We can't be any less. So what you have um, in front of you is our draft amendments that incorporate the major changes, the major things in that ordinance, um, and, and really I think the things that are going to be most important, most uh, controversial perhaps, or, or have the most comment on, are the, the sections dealing, uh, I think it starts with 12C, that deals with non-conforming structures. That's the big one. Um, the non-conforming structures are structures that are within 75 feet of the high water line or the, the highest annual tide or the upland edge of the wetland. And we have a lot of those types of structures mm -hmm. along Shipwreck Road in Higgins Beach. We have some in Pine Point, not as many, um, uh, and a few, very few at Prout's Neck, and a few scattered in other places. Um, and so that's my elevator pitch, and I'd like to know if, if there's anything I can answer or clarify for you folks. Councilor Clucci? Would adopting this impact any current projects or, or something coming through the pipeline, or is there a like a separation period. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, so if we've already permitted something but it hasn't been built yet and there's a six-month window in which they need to start, if we were to adopt this in that six-month period, it would not impact those, those projects that we have already permitted. It would only per impact those projects that would come online after this ordinance was enacted. Is there any benefit if there's somebody that's thinking about doing something or in the start, you know, the early process right now, like when does this take effect after it uh, 
is it immediate or within a month or, or something like that? I'm wondering if there's an opportunity or a benefit to creating a larger window where right. we prove it and it might take effect in six that, months. That's actually a great question. I'm not 100% certain myself exactly when the council, if the council approves this, I'm not exactly sure when that would go into effect. By your own rules, ordinances become effective, I believe, uh, 12 o'clock midnight the next day, uh, unless otherwise specified. So you are able to uh, create a, a different effective date. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Similar to marijuana. Councillor Hamill. Uh, we had the good fortune of sitting uh, th through this with a uh, thorough review from Brian yeah. and the Ordinance Committee, Chimarie and, uh, and Ken and I. Um, so I want to thank you for that. But I did have a couple of follow-up questions. One was, and I know you answered it before, but I think it'd be good for the benefit of the council to hear it. Does this apply to commercial and residential structures, uh, the changes? Yes. And is there any pending development or, um, you know, project that's, that's driving these changes? There's no specific one project that's driving these changes. Again, I started this process about a year and a half ago. It takes a while in our busy town to get the time to insert all of this um, verbiage into the ordinance and make it make sense. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I'm hoping that it is. Um, one thing that did um, come up as part of this and, and prompted us to, to, to say, you know, we probably ought to get on this. Um, in a, I, I don't want to throw this up because there's nothing in the works with it, but you all know where Cliff's Antiques store was on, on mm -hmm. US Route 1. There's mm. a part of our existing ordinance that we always thought uh, it has to do with the Stream, Protect Stream Protection District. Right. We always thought it was an overlay district. But in examining our ordinance and with legal counsel's uh, interpretation as well, we realized that it doesn't work that way, the way it's written. We thought it did. We thought it was an overlay district which would allow Cliffs Antiques, being a commercial building, to be redeveloped or, or reused for commercial uses. But in, in effect, the way our ordinance is currently written, it would prohibit that building from being used as a commercial building once the use has ceased for 12 months, which it has because it's been on the market for that long. Um, and so we, what we intended, what we thought we had intended was to allow the underlying zone's uses to, to be allowed and just the setbacks from the resource, from the stream or from the high water line and those types of issues, uh, as well as possibly impervious surface or non vegetated surface limitations and those kinds of things, the environmental stuff, could still, would still trump our existing ordinance, but the uses would still be allowed. So, so one of the changes that we'll, we've had in there is to correct that and make that an overlay zone. And you'll notice if you go down through the different zones, the only zone in the shoreland ordinance that stays a zone or a district of its own is the resource protection district where there is very little development to begin with uh, by, by design. Great, thanks Brian, thank you. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I think you referenced um, shipwreck, that, that they'll be, how are they, will they be financially impacted? What are the implications on? <laughs> shipwreck road is, is impacted by so many regulations now. You have sand dune regulations, you have floodplain yeah. ordinance regulations, you have piping plover regulations. Yeah. There are just all kinds of right. layers of regulation there. Um, the, the, major, the major difference, one of the major differences in, in the proposed amendments, currently, if you have an, an older cottage on Shipwreck Road, I'll just use that as an example, and you wish to tear that cottage down and rebuild that cottage, or rebuild a cottage may be bigger. Everybody wants to build Higher. bigger. Um, you cannot do that voluntarily without going to the Zoning Board of Appeals and applying for a variance. The only variance you can apply for is a hard, standard hardship variance, which says you ha have no reasonable return from that property unless you get a variance. Very difficult to prove, very difficult to get. The state's regulations don't require that. They only require that you move that cottage back to the greatest practical extent or the setback, whichever comes first. That determination is currently done by the planning board. Another change in the ordinance is that we would put that on the zoning board to decide. You wouldn't be going for a variance. You would simply be going for a determination if you've located that, proposed to locate that structure back to the greatest practical extent. Most of those cottages can't move <laughs> because of other regulations and because of setbacks mm. to the street. So that's where the zoning board makes that determination. So that's just an example. Um, 
that's one of the changes. The other change is that um, if you've ever dealt with shoreland zoning, we currently have allow non-conforming structures to expand by 30% area and volume. Volume is everything between the roof and the walls and the ground. Area is the number of uh, living, the, the, the area of the living space floors between the walls. The volume calculation gets very difficult when the shoreland zone line cuts through your house diagonally and mm. perhaps through your, the ridge of your roof diagonally. Very difficult to track, very difficult to, to calculate. The current, uh, the proposed amendments would take away that 30% volume calculation and they put a cap on the height of the structure. Hmm. That's the part that may be controversial. There'll be winners and losers. I heard somebody say that earlier. There's going to be winners and losers with this just the way there is now. It's just going to be done in a different way. Council Glycine? Um, I had a question on that reconstruction or replacement. Um, it says that uh, <coughs> if damaged or destroyed, um, by more than 50% of market value, how is how is that going to be determined? Um, just the market value at the time, and was it in other places? Is it sometimes 50% of the physical like volume or whatever, like you were describing? Well, again, we're mirroring we're mirroring mirroring the state's sure. uh, guidelines. That's the exact language that's in the state's guidelines. So, do we need to flesh that out to say how that will be determined? The, or is it you're just going to do a market? Like a market a, analysis appraise, is done by appraisal. an appraiser. Okay. Um, you have the you have the option of having your own appraisal done on the structure. If you don't want to do that, you can take the assessed value. We can use that. Okay. You're usually better off to buy your own appraisal. Yeah. But that's well, your not choice. Hmm? So not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different department. Oh, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, no, there, there are various ways of doing that, and it just has to be an agreement that, you know, you've presented me with something that makes sense. It's, it's done by a professional who's, you know, capable of doing that, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what we'll, we'll agree to use. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, just one last, going back to shipwreck and the volume thing mm -hmm. you used, is there a grandfathering? So if someone bought a property, assuming with a 30% volume, they'd have some expansion opportunities, and if you change it to just a height, you know, will they be grandfathered that if they bought it and the ordinance was in place when they bought it, that they'll be able to execute that? Or will, will what you're doing supersede so that so yeah, there no, may be if they cases have, if they haven't already proposed a change if they don't already have an application right. into yeah. us they're not they're not grandfathered just because they bought it under the old <coughs> ordinance right. okay. the new ordinance but, will take but, precedent so that that maybe is yeah. where there'll be some yeah yeah they're, maybe they're, perceived as losing sure yeah. and, and you'll note that it says it it gives you a cap height of 20 feet for example or the existing height of the structure so if you're already at 25 yeah. you get to keep 25. Any more? Thank you. Public comment before we put this on the table? None? Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> Councilor Hamill? Yeah, I'd just like to take the opportunity to uh, uh, thank uh, Brian and his staff and Jay and his staff. I mean, these folks uh, uh, spend uh, countless hours uh, and this is their their main focus and uh, we're lucky to have them as resources and we you know we uh, appreciate the work they do and uh, you know they're really on the you know on the front end of all of this growth and development uh, activity so we're lucky to have them and we appreciate their their competency and their good work so thank you Councillor Katarina um, again this was before ordinance, um, so we, we have looked at it. Um, and, and being, again, in real estate, I know the shoreland zoning issues, they've changed, and the Attorney General's office is gonna start getting all over towns who haven't updated. So that's a major driving force behind doing this. Um, we don't wanna be in violation of the state shoreland zoning rules or there could be fines or whatever so any more no I'll, i just i miss cliff and cliff's antiques 
Me too, bring it back. <laughs> yeah. And I'll never publicly crash one of your ordinance committee meetings again. <laughs> oh, come Thank on. you. I threw that thing into a tailspin. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Unanimous. <laughs> Order number 20031, first reading is scheduled a public hearing on the new small wireless facility license and ordinance. Jay? Sure, I'm back again. So let's see, this is an item that actually was brought up to me a few months ago by our IT director, she happened to send me an email, said, hey, are you aware of this thing that's happening with these small cell facilities. And as, as I started to dig into it, we identified that, in fact, we probably need to start having a conversation. Um, because there was uh, changes at both the federal and more importantly at the state level just this last summer um, that um, constrained our local ability um, to regulate small cell facilities 5G type facilities in the public right away. Um, so essentially our home rule was superseded um, and we have to allow for facilities within the public right away. However, the legislation at the, both the federal and state level had, it gave the town some authority over a few of the elements, um, um, the siting of these. Um, and those really are related to one, licensing fees. They are in our public right away that the town owns, so um, there is some licensing fees that the um, town can enact. The, the, the higher end of the fee structure was, uh, it is uh, capped um, by federal um, action. Uh, there's aesthetics, so you can get into the placement and how these things look within the right of way, but again, you have to allow for them. And then what's uh, deemed a shot clock or how long it takes to process an application when it comes in. Um, and so interestingly, after that conversation with the IT director, we did start to get some calls from providers saying, hey, we're, you know, we're interested in um, go coming in town. And we sort of said, well, we don't have an ordinance in place, but we're working on something. Would you mind sort of waiting? And they, they've been patient, which is Good. Um, and so what you have before you is language that's really aimed at um, those three elements that we're able to um, approach. Um, frankly, you know, wireless facilities, 5G, that's not my area of expertise. So hopefully you don't have any questions about the technology itself. Um, but uh, we did spend some time taking a look at model ordinances, both sort of uh, nationwide, talking to other uh, municipalities in Maine, um, talked to a number of uh, my, my cohorts, not a lot of communities have really started to take this up and when I talked to them and they, you know, talked about the changes at the state level, they were like, oh, geez, I, we weren't aware of that either. So um, I think there's going to be start to be um, some more action around, around this item. Um, so I think as Brian did, I'll sort of stay at the high level. I'm not going to walk you through every bit of the ordinance, but um, obviously we have three members of the ordinance committee member uh, who um, we discussed a number of these items with. And so with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Is there okay. uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to ask for public comment. So <laughs> please yeah. ask a question. Um, is there anything about noise? Some of these things can have noise. Is that anything that can be regulated? Um, I guess I haven't heard noise, haven't seen in my reading on these that noise has been an issue with these. So that's not something um, that we explored to date. So you don't know whether or not we're allowed to regulate that or we're not <clears throat> allowed to regulate that? Um, so where we're able to we may, I, I don't know for certain. And again, I, I haven't ex seen that in my reading as an issue, um, but okay. certainly could be. Any public comment? No, oh, I'm sorry. I, I had one question. No, I'm sorry. I, I, this is a bit of a repeat. We asked some of these yeah. questions in uh, 
an ordinance, but I thought for the, the benefit of the, the council, it might be helpful to talk again. I think we had somebody from AT&T who was looking to put up four of these or something like that. I was kind of curious if we had a, you know, any new numbers on how many are out there already, and, and if there's going to be four from AT&T, can we have any idea of expecting how many there will be and, you know, what yeah, time uh, frames? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, as you referenced, the uh, uh, the representative from at and said they're looking at four or five locations in town. We don't know what those locations are yet. Um, I haven't heard any specific numbers from any other providers at this point. Um, these are typically, you know, as I understand them, again, this isn't sort of the, tech, the technical aspect isn't, isn't my realm, but as I understand them, I really sort of think of these sort of as, as boosters in, in and you locate them more in dense neighborhoods or commercial neighborhoods. So you might see a few in the Oak Hill area or maybe um, as, a, as one example. But I don't think you would see them, you know, in the lower de density type areas of our community. So we'd probably see more of these in the growth areas. How many that would be, I, I unfortunately can't answer that. Um, I did explore the question. The question did come up is, are there any in town? Um, I was unaware of any. I've asked other department heads if they're familiar. Um, we aren't aware that there are any currently in town. All right, public comment now. I was trying to get to you. <laughs> Hi, Allison Bristol, 6 Bayview Avenue, Higgins Beach. And I went to the last ordinance meeting to hear about shoreline zoning and got the added benefit of learning about the uh, 5G technology. And the first thing I would say is, as an AT&T customer, I would be more than happy to have a booster <laughs> to make my reception at Higgins Beach better. Um, but I, reading over, and listening to Jay at the meeting and reading over his memo in the proposed draft, um, my concern is that a 10-foot antenna on top of a utility pole, along with a refrigerator-sized equipment box, would really be an eyesore along Bayview Avenue or any of the roads that may, you know, go along the, the water or the marshes. And um, so I'm wondering if there might be some language that could be added to the draft to better protect those views and vistas. So I poked around a little bit, and I was looking for examples of other ordinances in Maine. And I uh, actually found one from York that I shared with Jay. Uh, they have a wireless communications facilities ordinance that was last amended in 2016, so it probably has to be brought up to speed for the 5G. Uh, that includes uh, protecting scenic and visual character of a community and its purpose. It also uh, includes provisions that require a minimum 65-foot setback from residential structures, and this might be to address noise concerns. An approval process that requires elevation drawings and written descriptions of the need for a particular facility to be in a particular location, as well as an abutter notification. So adding similar language to Scarborough's ordinance to the extent possible would better protect the scenic views in Scarborough's residents. And also worth mentioning, um, I also found a, a press report on Seacoast Online uh, from last October that reported on AT&T's 5G application in York. And listed as immediate town concerns were visual impacts, sidewalk blockage, which Jay has addressed, and, and an equitable <coughs> lease for the town which Jay has addressed, but also uh, one of their immediate concerns was possible radiation yeah. and sound from humming noise. So something we should certainly do due diligence on if we haven't already. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion on the table? So moved. <clears throat> Excuse Second. me. Discussion? Councilor Katarina? Uh, yeah, as mentioned, this went through ordinance, um, asked a lot of questions about it. I will tell you that this summer after the state passed, whatever they passed, uh, Representative Chiazzo, Chris Chiazzo used to be on the town council. He's on the EUT uh, committee that deals with these issues. He sent me an email, give me a heads up that we were in way out of line with what we had 
and needed to look at this. So um, there is concern from the state and feds for better or worse that, uh, you know, we have to meet certain guidelines. So that's part of where this is coming from. Any more? Council Glassing? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Ms. Bristol's um, comments deserve a lot of um, attention uh, to make sure that we are protect everybody wants better cell coverage but we want to make sure that we protect property owners as well um, and I guess a question for Jay is did you look at the town of York and to see any of the things about aesthetics <coughs> and um, the distance from the residents and why or why or why not did you yeah decide actually, to include uh, that um, as I, as I mentioned to Ms. Bristol in our email, actually that's one of the planners I did speak to. Um, and he actually informed me that they didn't have an ordinance that regulates these. Hmm. I think their, their wireless telecommunication ordinance or whatever it is, is really about, uh, much like we have an ordinance about wireless okay. telecommunication. So um, they have some language in there that I think is, you know, might, could, could be applicable. Um, so, um, yeah, the, he was one of the, he was actually one of the planners who was like, oh man, I guess I gotta get something ready for my uh, town meeting. So, five, um, yeah. yep. So, um, but certainly if at the direction of council, there's some additional things to look at, you know, I, I don't see why we couldn't keep poking a little bit as we go through this iterative process where we still have the planning board public hearing and your public hearing and right, so on and I, such forth. So, you know, clearly yeah. the, the, um, you know, the vendor, would want as few restrictions as possible and you know we want that to proceed like people say hey you know everyone wants better cell coverage but do we have the protections in there to protect specific property owners and what would they uh what would they <coughs> how would it work you know you'd want to get feedback from the vendors as well okay what what if it what if the ordinance said this you know what how would that how would that work for you i mean and you know i think the aesthetics argument and you know potentially any kind of disturbance. I mean, we saw the absolute state huge issue over the meters and people's concern, whatever <coughs> your opinion is, was or is on the metered boxes that CMP put out and mm -hmm. the state eventually had to say, well, we'll let you do have the old box. So there is um, people who actually have that concern and I think it's at least worth um, exploring that. Councilor Clucci. Uh, wow, have you guys been busy uh, <laughs> between ordinance and planning? This is a lot uh, to digest. I just want to say it's really exciting technology, uh, 5G, and really transformative. Hmm. So uh, I'm excited for it coming down the pike. I don't know how long it'll be before it uh, is actually having a big impact in, in, in Scarborough. So I think we do have some time to work out some of the details. Uh, hopefully and understand how, you know, we can ad adopt the best that we can. So thanks for your comments. Councillor Katarina. Um, just uh, for the public and, um, and council to know, um, having been on the council when we had cell phone came up, I forget when, when I, previous <laughs> councils, um, and a lot of people, cell towers I should say, uh, and a lot of people, you know, were concerned about health concerns and whatever. Well, federal law says you can't even take that into consideration. So just want to make that clear. Councilor Hamill? Yeah, another point of clarification is that, uh, you know, this, you know, I'm not certain, but I think the uh, ordinance that was referred to in New York had to do with macro cell, you know, the big yeah. tower. Uh, yeah cell towers like the one in front of the public safety building and what we're talking about is small cell uh, wireless and those are things that are going to be put on you know on existing poles for the most part or there'll be smaller poles as i understand it so so the other thing is i'd say is that it's absolutely right for us to cycle through the public comment and questions uh, yet at the same time do be fair to be fair i'm sure the the vendors you know the telecoms providers will have additional information you know, so we ought to make sure that that's you know, part of the process as well as we cycle through it. So. Just to be clear, it's my understanding they can do it now with, with or without us. Yes. So, yep. you know, right. I, I'm not saying we rush this, but there's also maybe mm -hmm. some urgency to getting something in place mm -hmm. yeah. right. for fear yeah. that uh, yeah. they're yeah. going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, just, just on that point, I, I believe it's 
we would have 60 days to process the application. Now, yeah. we have no ordinance currently right now, so I'm not sure what we would do to process it. And 90 days to approve it, again, having no ordinance, I think we would just stay silent on it. After 90 days, they can go. Um, that's as I understand it. Barring writing in an ordinance that sort of works us through the process. I, Jay, I know you just said that, but I apologize. I'm running out of steam. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we we have 90 days, and then they can start using they can start using they the could the, implement they okay. could install one. Yep. Which I know you just said, but yep. I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I mean, I guess in purpose tonight. Yeah, I mean, I'd support this, but if there's ways to incorporate some of the public comments wherever we can, I think that would be great to tweak it if we could. So yeah, yep. that's great. Yep. Any more? Yeah, I, I mean, I am looking at York's, and it does say microcell, so there, there's something about microcell in it. So, okay. all right. All right. Okay, I, I'm going to actually abstain simply because I ran out of steam. I had, this is the first time I've seen this, so I, I look at this packet, and obviously it looks like we should do this, and Allison's concerns I think are valid, but I just don't, I, with the packet, I just don't feel right voting on something I didn't even have time to sit down and spend time on. So, but those are my comments. Um, can't, I don't believe you can abstain. Can I, I can't abstain? Unless you have a... a I'm sorry. I'm All right. I'll just vote no on it. Yeah, it's fine. Under, under the rules. Soft yeah. no. <laughs> okay. Fair qualified, enough. Qualified no. Yeah. Qual okay. So it's we've all been there. We've all done the qualified no, right? So this is a first read, right? Yes. To, yeah. Schedule the public. Totally hearing. agree. I totally agree. I just don't feel. I just don't feel appropriate if I haven't read the. I, hear my, you. I haven't done my homework. But so Jay, you talked about the planning board process. Were you talking about in general for? So this is, we're not looking to send this to the planning board. We're looking to send this to a public hearing and then adopt yeah. it, right? Uh, I, I guess I, would, I don't believe this would need to go to the planning board. Okay. Um, okay. I, think I, I think I might have misspoke because in, in my mind, typically these <laughs> ordinances do roll through planning board. But yeah, where this isn't in Chapter 405 or 405C or B or um, the, the ones I typically work in, you're, probably, you're right. It doesn't necessarily require planning board um, and so certainly depending on when council decides to schedule this I think um, if you you know staff could work on looking at a few of the elements that were discussed here tonight and potentially bring forth some additional language for your consideration through the process but you don't see any benefit to, to putting it in front of planning um, that may have been a tough question yeah, I, but it's not that's not what we're looking to do no, right yeah okay. and I'm sorry if I misspoke on that that's I just want to make a public apology for uh, rec specifically requesting that Jay include that little booklet on, you know, small micro cell uh, <laughs> technology. So uh, no, that that, I got it to the, the only thing I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all those in favor? <laughs> all those opposed? <laughs> I hung my head. I just, listen, I can't do it. I didn't read the book. <coughs> oh, boy. Uh, order number. Order number 20032, first reading is scheduled a public hearing on the proposed amendment to chapter 313A, the Town of Scarborough Property Tax Assistant Ordinance, Section 5, determination of eligibility and amount of eligibility. This and is I mine. believe, Councilor Cat, mine. yep, Councilor Caterina will lead it yeah, off. Yeah, um, I brought this forward to ordinance um, for a few reasons. One was, you know, I was got thinking about the discontent with the tax breaks that we've been giving to so-called wealthy corporations. So there's some of that discontent in town and, and the fear that we're not doing enough for seniors who may be having trouble with taxes. Also, uh, as an attempt, um, a good faith attempt to help out people with some of the uh, may have been negatively impacted by revaluation to some degree. Um, and and just so you'll know, um, I'm sorry, I should have started by saying this is raised to $750, the senior tax credit. I'm, it's getting late, sorry. From $600 to $750. Uh, 750 will buy a lot more fuel, food, or prescriptions for those seniors who are in need. And frankly, it's the right thing to do. Just a few facts for you. The median age of those currently receiving the $600, the median age is 77. The median income is twenty thousand dollars. 
their median property tax is $3,300, which means that they're paying a, a percent, 16.5 percent of their income uh, to taxes. Uh, with the $600, their tax, uh, they, they're only, it reduces their percentage of income to tax to 13.5 percent. With 750, it would push it further down to be 12.75 percent. Um, the cost is an additional $58,294. Um, we had 10% increase in participation in years one and uh, over years one and two, which I would expect with a new um, uh, program like this. We had 3% increase in the third year of it as people became more familiar with it. It also helps people who are rentals. You have to be 62 or over and ten, thank you, 10 years a resident and your household income cannot exceed $50,000. When it was first uh, developed, it was meant to be a fairly simple way and to help out because the state had been messing around with things. And if, as an aside, um, since I have the floor, uh, homestead exemption this year is going up to $25,000 which is, means that your value, if you're, you're the primary, uh, if it's your primary home, um, you get immediate reduction in your valuation of $25,000. Uh, you have to have lived in your home for one year, and I believe they're taking applications till April 1st. So I believe it or not, there are people out there who forget to apply. You just go to the assessor's office, or you could contact me and I can get you an application. But anyway, that's it. So that's where I'm coming from with this. And I'm sorry, I'm being very verbose. Paul's giving me the signal. No, no, no. I was just <laughs> the timing of the second reading. Yes. And what I want to do with this is have our first reading to the public hearing because I want to tee it up for budget, make sure we've got money in the budget for it, and then complete it once after the budget season. So hold off second reading until June, I guess. All right? That's it. Okay, is there a motion on the floor? So moved. Second. Move my own. <laughs> yep, you just did. Good. Discussion? Councilor Hamill? Yes, I uh, am in support of this, uh, the concept of it, the need of it. Uh, I think it is uh, you know, definitely something that will have an impact. I think we are, have we been uh, remiss in terms of, uh, you know, trying to uh, do things for the taxpayers and to provide some additional relief so I think those are all good reasons at the same time I think this is just one more apple that's <coughs> got to go into the cider press of the budget process so you know the timing of the you know of the second reading and the final approval vote I think is will allow for that Councilor Hayes yeah I mean I guess conceptually um, it, I am concerned about the budget process. I think we're spending on this program about 240,000. This adds, if I read it right, another 60 or 70 K to the budget, you know, draw, if you will, or impact. Um, it is a 25% increase, which is pretty significant. I, I would rather see something indexed that it increase, whatever the base level is, if it's 600, it increases 3% a year or 5% a year. Um, there is no free money. This, this, this just shifts the tax burden to other taxpayers. I would much rather us focus on how do we take a look at our expenditures and reduce our expenditures so all taxpayers benefit. So uh, I'm fine tonight with this being a placeholder with the caveat that it, it, it is not determined, there's not an expectation, it needs to get through the budget process. And we will, if we do this, just there will be other things we won't be able to do. So we'll have to make choices. Councilor Glassing? Yeah, I, I totally concur with those comments um, by Councilor Hayes. Uh, you know, so if, you, if you're making 55K, you're not eligible, and yet, you know, this is going to be an impact on budget. The mill rate is going to be a challenge this year. So, um, you know, as long as we're not being obligated to that uh, with this move in this board, I think it, it was, you know, it's a good thing to look at. Councilor Clucci? Uh, yeah, I, you know, re referring back to the, rec uh, the reval, sorry, uh, 
low income and lower value properties were disproportionately impacted. And we talked about this at, at that time. And I, I, I think this is at least something that we can do to help compensate for that because those folks saw massive increases where some of the folks at the higher end of the scale did not. So um, I fully support this and thank you for bringing it forward. I do have a question and this refers to the last order as well. But do we, when we say schedule a public hearing, do we usually actually schedule it or just say that we're scheduling? Because there's no date on um, the prior order number and there's no date on this one. This one is scheduled, would be scheduled for the next meeting on the 18th. What? But in the motion, it, it states that. If you look at the motion, it's in the motion. I'm in the wrong place. For three, it's scheduled for public hearing. For Wednesday, March 18th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Does anybody want to offer up an amendment to make that later and closer to budget season? I'm confused now. I thought we I thought it was proposed to come back in June. For yeah, this is, just the public, this is just the public hearing. Oh, public, public hearing. hearing. But I just, if we were concerned about making it part of the budget process, I didn't know if making the public hearing in the middle of the budget process would make the more, most sense. I think it may get lost. Okay. Well, that's my opinion. Right. I'd rather have well, a separate public hearing. Sorry. And, and I guess I'd be in the other place. Until we know what the budget looks like, it might yeah. be really helpful to have it in the middle of the budget process that, that's what I, that was what as, I was as we as we try to get a, in, input from the community about, you know, what are the trade-offs they're willing to make, either higher taxes or what programs do we need to look at and what, yeah, so I'd rather have it in the middle of the process when people have more information. Are you making an amendment? Make an amendment? So I'd make an amendment to have this, I don't know, Tom, what would be a good date? It's uh, probably your first meeting in May, by then you'll be... Okay. Uh, second reading is scheduled for the 15th, so you'll be very near the end of the budget at that point. So whatever date that is, the regular meeting date, first meeting in May. So... The yeah, I, it doesn't matter to me. I okay. mean, that's fine. So the amendment would be to have the have the public hearing in that first meeting event. Mm -hmm. That's May 6th, I believe. May 6th. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Discussion on the amendment. Makes sense to me. All those in favor of the amendment. Okay. Back to the main motion on the table. Is there any more discussion? <coughs> no? Okay. I will just add, I, I, I will echo uh, Councilor Colucci's thoughts. I think um, you know, we talk a lot about our 3% tax rate goal, and I've always perceived it as protection specifically to this resident that has such a hard time paying their bill. So um, there's a lot of families, maybe I'm not going to be very popular for saying this, but there's a lot of six-figure families in Scarborough that can afford to pay a little bit more. And this is a way of using a mechanism to shift that burden ever so slightly away from our most people that need it the most and more towards people that I think are willing to pay higher taxes from time to time. Not everybody, don't quote me on that. Um, but, I, but I think this is a mechanism to do that. So as it sits right now, I support it. And I also agree with actually Councillor Hayes where it would be nice to set it and forget it and actually have a mechanism where we don't have to do this every year. Cause I've, I've been on this council for a very short period of time and it, it's come up kind of two or three times already. So it would be nice to just know that we have it it, predictable predictability is a good thing so uh, okay all those in favor Unanimous. okay order number two zero zero three three first reading is scheduled a second reading on the bond order for approved municipal and school capital improvement projects and the refunding of certain general obligation bonds for the town of Scarborough and I believe our finance director is here I'll introduce and Ruth will back clean up to the extent that I miss something, which is likely perhaps. But uh, this this is the time of year where we do go back out to the bond market. Uh, our bond, our financial advisors advise that the April, early May time frame is kind of the optimal time at the market. Uh, it may be very fortuitous uh, right now, given yeah. some of the yeah. things yeah. happening in the market as we speak. What's before you is a mix of uh, town council approved uh, borrowing uh, through a budget. Uh, the budget process, as well as some, and I think there are three different voter-approved items uh, through the years, 
and we've worked with bond council to segregate uh, out those different uh, categories, if you will. You will note that it spans over a series of fiscal years, uh, some of them dating back, and, and the oldest one happens to do with, uh, with actually land bond monies that uh, by their very definition in nature, we don't borrow until there's a need. So it's not surprising that those are some kind of very old authorized bonds just now coming um, put into play. So um, perhaps at a risk of confusing things further, this bond order is about $6.6 .6 million in total. Uh, we'll actually be going to bond for $7.48 million, and that's because we already have additional bond authority prior from council that we simply have not exer uh, exercised. And, uh, and, and these projects are to the point where we do need to go out and, and secure those, uh, those funds at this point. So again, this bond order is for just over 6.6 .6, uh, million, but the actual issue that we go to market with is uh, 7.48 million. Uh, the matter was brought to council, excuse me, the finance committee somewhat um, quickly last week, and uh, we appreciate them squeezing us on the agenda. Uh, there was a request from, I believe, Councillor Clucci at the time to include a, an estimate of the likely maturity or term of each of these bonds. Uh, which uh, Ruth has done. She's put together kind of a detailed um, sheet in back. Uh, in addition, I believe there was a request for indicating how much money's actually been spent to date, and so that was uh, information included as well. Uh, it's worth noting for council and for the public as well that not all these projects are created equal. Uh, many of them we would be bonding for a five-year term because of their nature and longevity whereas some other ones are longer term, again, because of what type of project they are and their useful life. Um, we'll finalize those details with, uh, with our financial advisor, but we think this is a fair estimate of where those uh, will generally be falling. falling. Lastly, uh, we are, uh, have put together a fairly tight schedule to get to market by the end of this month, and so it starts tonight. Uh, we do have rating calls scheduled with the rating agencies, so this month we'll be busy working with them <coughs> and culminate again at the end of the month with a competitive bond sale. So with that, Ruth and I are available for questions if you have them. Councilor Clucci? Uh, so I, I have been able to look through this, and uh, the only question mark in, in my mind right now relates to the Eight Corners portables and whether that's uh, well, one, I think we should be transparent. If it is over $400,000 improvement, we should be saying that. And, um, and maybe actually show an accounting of this is what the capital improvement has cost to date, and this is what this will add to it. Um, so that we can just make a formal decision that, yes, we want this to kind of like we did earlier, you know, kind of not necessarily tightly fit with the charter, but be justifiable. The, 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 uh, the applicable section would be section 907 of your town charter. Yeah. Uh, and it has to do with any single capital improvement. Uh, in, I guess, partial response to your question, I would suggest to you that uh, though they are similar projects, they are different schools and they are... No, I'm not, uh, the same school. It's going to be attached to the existing one. So the, yeah, you're the, talking the, about eight the eight corners. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pleasant Hill and Fine with. Well, yeah. my, my comments are confined to the four corners of what's in front of you. Um, so uh, there are two projects. There are two separate portables at two separate schools. Okay. I know your other concern has to do whether is uh, whether this is actually considered a capital project. No, I, that was my concern with, and that's what I was trying to clarify with Jay. His response was, yes, this is a capital improvement. It's permanent. I actually disagree. <laughs> I don't think it is. But if that's the case, if that's the standard that we're using, then these are two parts of the same capital improvement. Um, John, can we save this a discussion when it's on the table? Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's OK. Yeah, I, yeah, just yeah, wanted, yeah. I just wanted to, because I want to respond to it, but I can't right now. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Peter? It, it, this actually was part of the lead-in. The other question that I think was asked at the Finance Committee by Council is that, and, and this is a question for both Ruth and Tom, just wanted um, the verification that everything that's on this list was something that was approved by the Town Council either 
in last year's budget or in prior budget. So everything you see has been something that's been approved by the town council. And I, we didn't have time to go back and check everything off. Yes. I think you guys were yes. going to verify that every one of these projects fit that bill. So I'm just looking for confirmation. Yeah, absolutely, for with the exception of voter approved uh, authorization. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Hamill. So my question is, uh, so I, you know, I see the total here is, uh, uh, you know, it's 5.4 million or so, something like that, and it goes back to 2014. And there's a detailed list. So, what's the? Is that just history of what was previously bonded, or is this? Are these things that were approved in those years that are now going to go bond? Those are these are all items that were approved and uh, authorized in those particular fiscal years, but were now, for one reason or another, in a position to actually secure. Right. They weren't fund. They haven't been funded yet. Correct. Okay. Correct. Great. In some cases, the projects have been delayed or deferred. In other cases, we've fronted money, and this will reimburse ourselves, if you will. Uh, but there's any number of reasons why uh, you know, there's been a delay between authorization and the need to secure financing. So my following question to that is, what did we bond last year, and did it have a similar tail going back to 2014, 2015? And I know, I know this is you know, not the material in front of us, but I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, uh, you know, year to year, it's it's variable. Yeah. Um, frankly, the, uh, the funding for the public safety building, just given the size, uh, has been okay. the tail that wags the dog in the last two or three years. Okay. But more times than not, we have found ourselves in a position of funding um, in the order of four million dollars or so Great. on a fairly consistent basis. And then there are anomalies uh, like the public Great. safety building. Great. Councilor, Thanks, Tom. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Don. Uh, thank Councilor Gleason. Um, Councilor Hamill. Uh, we did ask that question in the finance committee Sorry. and there is sometimes when it's not spent and the town goes back and says do you actually have the plan to spend this and it would get dropped off okay great so there that actually I don't we didn't go through great. examples but we did terrific we did ask that question and it has happened where they just say no it's not gonna be spent thank you thanks very much I'll stick, uh, this will just be a question, but the uh, failure of the turf and track, did that affect the bond order or what we, what items we included? Not it wouldn't have been in there anyways. If they had approved it, we might have put some in there. And, and even then it would be um, particular to whether the work was done or it is expected to be undertaken. We are uh, required through IRS and SEC rules that we cannot borrow money um, we need to spend it within a certain time frame of receiving the proceeds. This is the so-called arbitrage rules, yeah. and uh, those are getting tighter and tighter. Um, mm -hmm. There's a six-month, a 12-month, and an 18-month uh, test you need to apply. So it's, it's important that we don't get ahead of ourselves. The other piece I was going to say is that we normally ask the departments because, you know, we don't know what their right. projects are. Right. And we ask them what they're going to spend between, what they think they're going to spend between, like, now and December. So that gives us like a nine month window to, uh, you know, so we have the money in hand if they actually do spend it. Councillor Hamill? Sorry, sorry to, to, you know, ask so many questions, but so is this, has this been approved by the Finance Committee? What's in front of us? So this was discussed at the Finance Committee, um, and there was a motion to approve that wasn't seconded. Uh, and not because we thought that there was anything wrong. All of our questions were answered satisfactorily, it, it's, it's from my perspective. Um, but I didn't feel comfortable approving it because I got it at the beginning of the meeting. It didn't have time to fully digest okay. it. Okay, no. great, thank you. Yeah, and the only thing we did ask for that they did is to, to give, we didn't have the summary page, yeah. so they put the summary page together based great. on the detail for the rest of the council. Thank you, thanks very much. Any more questions? There is one typo in here. It doesn't change the totals, but it does change it for the project. And that is in the 1920 school department, middle school HVAC program. It should be 263, 795 instead of 975. That's unacceptable. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Sevens, table. nines, they're so close. <laughs> <laughs> He's a math teacher. <laughs> Sixes and nines. So. All right, do I have a motion on the table? Uh, so moved. And a second? Second. And discussion. Councilor Clucci. <laughs> yeah. 
what was I talking about? The you were talking uh, about the <laughs> 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 Come on, you should Second know what you're unit. talking about. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a permatemper. It, it says it's an undefined status. But anyways, my, my point with this, I guess, is um, I, I think we've demonstrated that we can be reasonable. And I feel like with this particular project, we've made a cascading series of really poor decisions that are going to negatively impact our students. And I, I, I want us to do it right. I would fully support connecting this thing to the building so that the kids don't have to get bundled up before going to their classroom. Um, and connecting, at, you know, adding these classrooms. I, let's, I, I'm open to doing it right, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I, I, I guess that's all I have to say. Now, technically, I think there could be a potential charter um, issue with this. But it's not clear because we're not clear what this thing is that we we put it's not a permanent building by some standards it is a permanent building by others and um, I just that's where I am I yeah and we you and I talked about this on the phone but we we had this discussion at some pretty great length when this first came to us because um, this these trailers were split up in such a way uh, particularly now that they've gone over that before they were not combined they were not at 400,000 yeah. and now that they've gone over they are at four hundred thousand, um, and we did make a we did make a decision to treat these as two separate pro, uh, projects. And I'm going off memory here, but the what was pitched to us, so to speak, was that the eight the second trailer that we're looking at now was not a certainty. Okay. So they, it was, however, they were going to lay the slab just in case they needed it. So the slab was the size of two of these bad boys, right? But they didn't know if they needed the second one. Yeah. Now, in retrospect to, you know, does that pass the sniff test maybe a year later? It, no, I don't know. But I do know that we as a council, and please anybody else that was involved in this can correct me, but we, this is, we, this is a lot of the energy at the workshop was spent around this. So, but I, I remember the decision point for me personally was we don't know that we need the second trailer. I think that's fair. I, yeah, I think yeah. that's the on the site plan. It, it actually specifically calls out if needed. Sure. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's on working for me. But I just wanted to respond to that's that. Yeah. And, and again, if anybody that. else recalls differently, please chime in. But I just I wanted to address that because I think yeah. it's fair. Thank you, <laughs> Councilor Johnson. I have a question. In, in the site plan, are these referred to as trailers or modulars? Because when I think trailers, I think of horses. I know. <laughs> when I think of modulars, I think of our children trying to nice. learn. You're going to have to ask Councilor Kluge any <laughs> he knows. I, I can bring it up. <laughs> Keep going. And okay, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll, all right. <laughs> Put that on hold, and we're going to go with Councilor Hamill next. So I know it's late in the day, and maybe that's benefit because hopefully many people are not watching. But is there any thought given to all, you know, all the discussion we've had about austerity and the hole that we have going into the budget process, has there been any thought given to the possibility of, uh, and you can, whether this person is in your hall of shame or hall of fame, pulling a, a uh, LePage and not approving this? No, this has been, you know, this has been previous, previously approved, but not funding it. And we, as I understand, would have the authority to do, to do that, to not fund it. The, the modulars? Not that what you mean? The whole thing. The whole. Oh. The, the so five you, million. You know, you like I look through this building? list and I see pickup trucks and a lot of equipment and and uh, I know a lot of these things have had tails on them and I'm I'm not proposing this. I'm I'm asking the question as a hypothetical. Is that a possibility? And if so, when would that decision be made? Well, I. I We've already spent 4.8 million of this, and we're expected to spend another 2.6 between now and December. Okay. So, uh, and we've done so on the authority granted through some sort of various approval processes. And I, we've got overstepped our authority, so I, I think it presents a serious cash flow issue. For so, us. how do, how will we spend something if we, uh, you know, how do we bond something that we've already spent? Well, depending. Yeah. Pardon? We use other funds and reimburse ourselves with, with bond proceeds. I mean, these projects are always rolling. And frankly, the frequency of our bonding annually is fairly much more frequent than, than most places. So we're able to float 
float the money and then reimburse ourselves. Yes. I assume we'll get okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, I mean, but I just kind of wanted to respond to, I think, to Councillor. You know, I mean, to the extent we've already spent the money, that, that's committed. But I think technically, I mean, not that we would, but if we haven't spent 2.6, I suspect there would be a process probably by which the town council could decide not to use those funds if that's something we wanted to do. Um, I, think, I think the decision point, your question about when would the decision need to be made, I think Tom's saying if Tom wants to go to the market in the next 30 days, that decision would be tonight or very soon that we would have to take something off the list that he wouldn't go to the market for. I mean, this isn't an ask, though. These, this is we're talking about reversing 10 years of voter voter approval right now. I mean, no, right? Vote, no, no Councilor, vote. council approval. Count, well, some is voters. There yeah, is the voter approvals. I don't think we can, but I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. just technically. Yeah. I think yeah. answering okay. Don's yeah. question. Yeah. That technically, there probably would be some pathway to do that. Not, but I'm not <coughs> here to suggest we necessarily do that. But I think okay. yeah. it's technically possible. Oh, sorry. Councillor Glycine and then Councillor Kluge. I, I guess um, I'm a little confused now. Um, that So we paid for the trailer slash modular slash capital slash whatever it is with school impact fees, but now we're going to bond them? That's a, no, it's a different, different trailer. One. Those are the ones that are already in It's a second trailer that doesn't exist yet. No, I, I know it's a different one, but if we still have school impact fee money, why wouldn't we fund those in the same way? I think that's a fair point. I think during they just they put it in their ca their CIP in their budget. They, they the the school board, but this. So we're going to pay for these many times over because of it. Well, or we're going to pay more for them because of interest, right? Compared to if we have oh yeah school sure, yeah. impact yeah. fee money. I mean we're we're also we spending we're also bonding eighty eight grand to outfit a classroom. I mean we're bonding eighty eight wow. grand to, to buy desks. So if we want to go down that rabbit hole, we, <laughs> well, we did last year. We'll I just, the, I mean, the same rationale we use for school impact, right. using no, the school yeah, impact totally. fees yeah. that we can only, we we can only refund or spend them on growth impacts. Okay. Let's go with Councilor Catering. I'm sorry. I, um, I I'm looking at bond myself. rates right now, and they're like one percent. So you got to think about that too. In other words, okay. it's, it's low. So if you're going to borrow money because you want to make your cash flow in business, you do this. You want to make your cash flow better. You want to have more cash to use, whatever. But if you, just you, you choose what you borrow on, particularly when it's at a lower rate like this. You don't pay cash all the time for everything because that's crazy. But there's a question in what makes sense to pay cash and what makes sense to ch put on the charge cards, sure. so to speak. And I think that's where you're coming from, Councilor Cooch, am I right, with your thoughts on what's longer term? Because we do have five year, which is a, a, a shorter And we tend to accelerate things. I um, had asked Ruth to put together that schedule that showed what we had spent versus what's remaining to be spent. Um, Kind of, I was thinking along the same lines, Don, not of not doing these, but given that we have other projects in the pipeline, we're not reducing our debt very much with this um, bond order. In truth, that probably isn't our decision to make today with this, but I wanted to understand it. Uh, so that, that's why I had gone through that uh, process. And I, I think Peter's right. We have the ability to do that. Um, just whether it's a good idea, I don't know. The bond rates are low, and uh, uh, and they're going to go up. And so I, I guess it's, I was conflicted, but I wanted to understand it a little better. And to just answer uh, Senior Counselor Johnson's question, I was incorrect. They're not. Um, senior. <laughs> well, senior. <laughs> senior. Senior. I'll come up with a better way. <laughs> that sticks. That sticks. It's, it's, okay, it's okay because you just woke him up. This is like the first time I've ever gotten a, a counselor in before an A. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to stick. He's going to be yeah, seen. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's it's going to stick. So, so they're <laughs> referred to on the site plan as one portable with two classrooms, phase one, and one portable with two classrooms, phase two. Okay. So they're referred to as portables. Portables. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Good. 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 Now you have your answer, yeah. senior cast. <laughs> um, just, just, just a quick response to, to, to the question about why. I think the decision about why we use the impact fees for the, because it, was, it wasn't in the budget, they needed to put them in place. That was a place right. we could go to. But we did have the conversation we're having tonight. The feeling really is those fees are supposed to be used for brick and mortar. I mean, it's, it's really, we had some of that same dilemma that is this really brick and mortar or is this really the intent? So I think we, we did it that way so we could get them ordered in place. Then we said what they need to do is put it in the capital budget going forward. And that's a, another question whether that's a legitimate capital item. And, but, but to answer your question, that's, that's why we're not trying to lean into the impact fees. We're trying to leave those in place for, and, and we're going to need them if we're doing a school down the road. That's well, right. and we have been paying down debt with them. It, yeah. Every two years they get applied. Right. Or they get applied every year, the, what we collected the prior. Second year prior. Hmm. Any more discussion? Councilor Kluge, could you you said something about this? Never mind. I can't. <laughs> okay. No, I wanted to, I wanted to dive deeper into what you said, but I I've lost it. What did I say? I, something you and so, no, when you uh, were discussing that, it's in our it's in our authority. Why would we do it or not? And you. Say, oh, oh, seven, oh to, to not bond. Right. Not you made some bond. reference about increasing. Okay. So overall, I, I think yeah. this year we're scheduled to pay down about okay. seven plus million of debt. Yeah. And this is taking on seven plus million of debt. Uh, mm -hmm. So our overall debt is going to be about the same sure. as what yeah. it was. Better interest and, rate. And been that way. That's Better interest yeah. rate. Same debt. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think. <coughs> No, go ahead, please. Minute, yeah. Well, minute, I think to address the question, yeah, I mean, the question, well, yeah, I mean, if we can borrow money when it's cheaper, that makes more sense. Sure, right. But I think what Council Hamill was trying to get to, if we don't need to spend the money in the first place, oh, that's that's a better place to be, you know, if you can save a million dollars by not spending. Don't grant authority uh, in the first place. I mean, rather than getting right. way down the road and trying to unwind it and causing... Oh, yes. Yeah. What I could Don't authorize it in the first place. Yeah, that's a good point. Would it be possible to make a motion, an amendment to... To this, to this order, and the, the amendment that I'm contemplating would be to to bond, put forward for bonding the amount that we've spent so far, which is 4.809298. But for the amount of money that we have not spent so far, 2.670585, except for what was voter approved, which would include the public safety building, that that not be approved at this time. Is there a second before we discuss it? Second for conversation. Can can the finance director right? I feel like that the finance director needs to address what would happen, right? So I can't explain with each of these, but there are some contracts that are already in place that would, you know, we we, we said we would pay so much right. during the summer for road construction or whatever it is. So. Yes, we haven't spent those funds yet, but you know the summer work is coming. It's the same thing with the school department. They do all of their new stuff, cleaning the floors, buying computers, installing computers during the summer months. So you know, if we said no to some of this, then they would they wouldn't be able to do their jobs. So this was technically approved by the voters last year when they approved the town budget in. June. Is that correct? The school's budget, yes. The school budget, but for the the other expenses that are not their municipal expenses, no. No, but the council did approve, approve the authority to spend. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's there's no requirement that the voters approve the Okay. The there, there are two pieces. There's the authority to spend, which is the budget process, and then there's the authority to fund it. So Right. Uh, bond council usually likes us to do them both at the same time. Right. However, it's hard to bond a 39 million project up front right. when you're only going to spend 36 or 37 million. So that's one of the reasons we try to hold off on the bonding until later in the mm -hmm. So this is hard to do real time, but what I'm after is there an amount of, that we have not funded yet that would be within our authority not to fund and to study further. And it doesn't mean we're not going to approve it, but 
would it give us a week? Would it give us some time to scrutinize that to see if there's any opportunity? Uh, otherwise, it's on to next year, and you know, it's water under the bridge. One thing that might help with this, we talked about in finance committee, the example of the fire truck. It's voter approved, but uh, we're going to pay 465,000 on that with this bond order. It takes over a year to actually outfit the truck to you know, be, between right. procurement and getting it detailed and everything else that they need to do. And I think that's applicable to several of these items. So I don't, I don't know how much opportunity there is without having a real negative impact. I can't say I know for sure what that is, but it, my sense is that it's not real big. Okay. Yeah. And then so with the uh, fire truck, for example, um, uh, the fire chief was able to negotiate a deal that if he paid a certain percentage up front, the total cost would be less. So, um, you know, so that all plays into it. The departments are really trying to find the best, um, I don't want to say cheapest, but the, the best cost for, for what they're trying to do. Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just one clear. So one, one consequence, if we're going to break, up, break it up in two different allotments, if you will, I mean, would that have an impact on transaction fees and other things? I mean, are there transactional? So if we, you know, to get to Council, if we did, you know, $3 million now and, you know, the balance in June after we had some time to look at it, by breaking it up in two different blocks, are there, there are opportunity costs? I mean, there are fees, the, the bond the, the fees cost are of pretty. The fees, those right. words, we'd still be having to pay those, but we'd probably have to pay them twice. We'd, we'd have to go back to the I mean, there's, there's certain fixed costs that you got to cover, so that so that that would add some <coughs> transactional costs, I think, Council Hamill, to what, to what you're suggesting. Okay. Yeah, and but, even if we were able to um, parse out those things that were contractually obligated for in the voter approval, which I think we could, and identify what's that left of, you know, what's that, that amount left that you could consider. I'm gravely concerned about what it would do and what sort of signals it would send to future investors that uh, to also potentially the rating agencies would catch wind that the, the governing body is not consistent in its, in its uh, you know, following through on its commitments and prior authorizations. Uh, I can't quantify how that would affect us, but I, I think there could be some uh, negative effect with that, that kind of um, unplanned decision. I think your better choice is, as a governing body, don't approve it in the first place. Right. Don't pull it back That's out. Right. So wait till next year. Wait till next year. Next month. Yeah. And, they used and to have a New York Giants, you know, <laughs> when they were losing team for 10 years. Wait till, wait till, next, wait year. till <laughs> next year. <laughs> Any more discussion on the amendment? Uh, may I withdraw my motion? Yeah, sure. It was never on the floor. I'd like to withdraw the motion. So, no, thank you so much. <laughs> You're withdrawing it? Yes. Okay. Well, that you makes that it? easy. Peter seconded that. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did. Now I give it to Coochie. <laughs> oh, wow. Nobody will ever believe it. <laughs> he goes down. <laughs> I considered it. <laughs> it's time to... Any, okay. Any discussion on the motion, the main motion? No, I guess what I'll say is, Don, you just scared the crap out of me there. But it was actually a really good, <laughs> at least it's a good conversation to explore what, you know, but <laughs> these, I mean, the, these were approved by previous councils. This is nothing new. But I do appreciate, that was some good understanding for me right there. So thank you. There's an example of a good conversation and we move forward. But I'm going to, oh, go ahead, sir. I think what you said made a ton of sense. And if we had come to that before and we had a list, I would have definitely been for your amendment. Yep. Note to file. <laughs> uh, well. A any other discussion? I'm going to get the last word in because you guys take my last word like five minutes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? All those opposed? I was just teasing accounts. Mm -hmm. um, number eight, non-action items. There's none. I'm sorry. No, uh, item number nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. We'll start with Councillor Cucci. I have nothing to update today. Councillor Hayes. Yeah, two quick things. Um, I wrote it down on March 23rd at 5.30. The Finance Committee will meet. We're going to 
work on the TIF policy and start looking at the five-year planning. Um, the Transportation Committee met and actually it, this really spent a lot of time talking about sidewalks and developers that may be in sort of place where they, you know, they're obligated to do sidewalks, but there's a sidewalk to nowhere, maybe having some type of impact fee or in lieu fee that they can pay. We talked about that, but what was interesting, which will feed into the conversation we had earlier, um, there are proposing to do a Haggis, I guess, Parkway study. They're getting very concerned about the traffic flows on that road because they say there's active interest in almost every single one of the lots out there now. So they're really worried about, and all, all the turn, all the entrance ways into the businesses are right opposite each other. So they're really worried about turning traffic yeah. and what they're yeah. going to do. But again, there's more indications that traffic is starting to become an issue as as we as we're dealing with growth so there's money's available to do an impact study or a, a traffic study um, and they're going to pursue those dollars and the Department of Transportation will be doing their own studies but this is for us to get a better feel for what might be going Just on I now. Could tag on that the good news is the highest Parkway itself does have adequate right of way and, yeah. right. and, and pavement width yeah. and right. so there's opportunities for pocket turn lanes or maybe right. even a center turn lane so we're in a much better situation there because of that roadway yeah. session. But That's true. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to look at that now. Um, senior advisory committee meeting was canceled, um, and I wasn't able to make it to the pest management um, committee meeting, but their 2019 update um, to the town council is out. It's on the website. Um, you go to uh, boards and committees and go to pest management, and it's prominently on their site, so anyone can read that. Um, and uh, Tuesday, we'll be having the next um, rules and policies, and we're still focused on the uh, charter. My turn? Yep, Councilor Katarina, sorry. Um, long range planning for all of you who would like to know what we do yeah. in long range planning. <laughs> Fair enough. Is it 8 a.m. Friday here in Town Hall and we are looking at the comprehensive plan uh, and ordinance will be meeting Thursday the 19th at 4 p.m. and the only thing on the agenda is what's next in growth, growth management and I have asked my fellow members of the ordinance committee to give me their thoughts so I would invite any of you to give your thoughts on what you think needs to happen, not happen, what you think it even means. Because that's my first question everyone is like, well, what do you think growth is? And I get 18 different answers, so that'd be a good place to start. All right, that's it. Councilor Johnson. Uh, we had a communications committee. We had a communications committee meeting this week. Uh, I was going to do a write-up because it was actually quite lengthy meeting. I thought it was a productive meeting. Uh, I think you may have received something from mm -hmm. Larissa on uh, feeding back into a community pulse type survey. So please take your time, give it some thought. We're asking for five questions. Uh, we've decided to come up with a, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna implement a Be Informed campaign, uh, dovetail it into the rollout of our new website uh, we're still working out the logistics on that, but, and more to come. Like I said, we'll write up the recap of that uh, meeting and get it to the council. But please fill out the forms on the questions. What What is it you want to know from the public? If we were to do a survey, community poll survey, that helps. I was I was actually a little confused by the directions on that. So okay, that makes more sense. Do you have Do you know how many? new subscribers you guys got for election day or an approximate count we don't have the numbers yet we think it's somewhere between 100 and 150 oh good nice yep so 10 percent possibly yeah. possibly a 10 percent rollout it was uh as everybody knows the polls well, were very busy yeah we were up anyway larissa we since the 1500 i think there had already been 100 added yeah yeah no, right so yeah, yeah we're up be, anyway yep. this would yep. be another nice it's it's slow but getting there Nice, good. Councilor Hamill? Uh, an appointments and negotiations committee. I'd like to uh, offer for the, town, the council, first notice, uh, uh, a recommendation to appoint Cheryl LaRue to the senior advisory committee as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2021. Um, also in our uh, meeting yesterday, um, we discussed uh, efforts to uh, 
generate new applicants and uh, you know, efforts to reach out hasn't really generated much in the way of new applicant flow. We are continuing to study opportunities to um, potentially consolidate some of the, the committees that are not required. And finally, we uh, reviewed uh, a survey of town manager compensation uh, with Liam Gallagher. So uh, that was very, very helpful, very productive. Nice. Uh, I'll use uh, my liaison report real quick. The, the, the consultant for the community center report has been received. Uh, it was received directly to the ad hoc community center committee's finance committee. They have it in their possession. I believe we'll probably be seeing it by the end of this week, if I had to guess, if not sooner, maybe tonight. It's actually, uh, I believe it's been posted online. Even better. By the town manager. Uh, so we are, are, there's a special meeting, town council meeting next Wednesday. It will be a two hour workshop with the presentation from the community center committee. We will not be taking any business. It will just be a two hour workshop. Um, and we're all, it will also be um, a public forum, not a public hearing, but a public forum. So members of the public are invited to come and they will actually be able to ask us questions. And I haven't, I haven't touched base with the, uh, Matt Tonello, who is the chair of that community center committee, but my hunch is he will be willing to take questions through me. So the questions will come through me and I'll essentially t toss them to him if it makes sense for him to answer them. Um, so again, Next week, Tom, before this meeting, agreed to, we'll start publishing that on the Facebook page. I don't know if we have a newsletter going out between then and then, but this, this might be worth a special edition. And we're going to get the report. We're going to get the consultant's report. It's going to be a public forum, no action day, us with really no time limit to be able to sit and take this all in. And is that at 7 o'clock? That is this next Wednesday. At 7 o'clock? At 7 o'clock. Did we make it at seven or six? I want to make sure. Seven. I don't think we scheduled that. I believe it was six. It was six. It, yeah, it's actually at six. I, I'll send out an email, but it is at, it's at six. I apologize. Six. I think it's scheduled six to eight. I'm sure we'd be willing to go long. And uh, I believe we're looking at somewhere between, it's either six or seven Wednesdays in a row that we will either be in session or at workshop. So buckle up. <laughs> yeah. The one that starts at five, we better improve. Just on the note, perhaps it's worth just, uh, I'll just run down through what the next five Wednesdays look like, just so you're aware of them. Uh, and it, there's some continuity and method to this madness. So as the uh, chairman mentioned, next week will be the community center workshop and public forum. Uh, the following week, with March 18th, we'll do a workshop and receive the Downs update. This is their required annual update. We're gonna reserve two hours for that, thinking that there's gonna be a lot of information to be shared. Uh, then on March 25th, there'll be a special meeting at which the council would consider uh, the next steps regarding the community center. So that would be in a position to, to make some decisions uh, as to next steps anyhow. April 1st, we are scheduled to have a workshop with a on the library expansion. And then it's a regular meeting to follow. Incidentally, that's the night I present the budget. And then uh, April 8th would be the first reading of the budget. So that's how the next five Wednesdays look. So Other quick updates? Did yep, I... sorry, town manager report. Just wanted to make sure uh, we recognize the efforts of Todi and her staff at uh, the, the polls oh, yeah. last night. Uh, totally unexpected. Um, this primary, this is the first in 20 years that there's been a statewide primary. One of the challenges that presents, uh, particularly in a town like Scarborough that has over 6,000 unenrolled uh, registered voters, uh, there is the ability for unenrolled voters to switch, uh, affiliate, even on the day of election. Right. And so uh, in addition to that, there's new voter registration that can occur uh, as well. And so that added a level and a d dimension of demand on Todi and her staff yesterday that they typically don't see. Beyond that, you know, we had 7,200 uh, votes cast yesterday, so it really exceeded all expectations. Wow. Uh, so great credit to Todi and her staff. Um, I guess the final challenge is the S Secretary, Secretary of State's office terribly underestimated the turnout and we had to print, photocopy, actually 950 additional ballots, uh, I guess the Democratic ballots. Wow. And that, uh, what that means for her is all hand count at the end of the night. So after a long day, uh, then they're asked to, to do some additional work. So great job, Tony. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Thank you. 
Uh, two other quick things. Uh, as was mentioned, the Barry Dunn's report is out. I will send a link, uh, or actually the report directly to you uh, first thing in the morning. I did want to mention for the public's benefit, uh, the town has been in a lawsuit with Piper Shores regarding a claim for partial exemption of some of their property for their skilled care, skilled nursing and assisted living portions. Uh, we do have a superior court ruling that is uh, very much in the town's favor, in term, in, really in, by, uh, in all counts. Um, I do honestly expect that the matter will be appealed to the law court, but uh, nothing has happened at this point. But having a lower court ruling in our favor is always helpful, and at the very least a validation that our arguments uh, rang true with the superior court judge. So with that. Great. Councillor comments? Uh, uh, Councillor Hamill? Uh, nothing to to say much except that uh, you know, Councillor or Chairman Johnson's comment about buckling up. You know, we are just really responding to the pace and complexity of issues that that are in front of us. So uh, you know, we'll do do our best, and uh, you know, it makes me think of the country and western song, uh, "Stop the world, I want to get off," or "Turn the world around the other way," but it's not going to happen. So. Senior Councillor Johnson? <laughs> That's the only time. I agree. It'll never happen again. <laughs> Just share a little, uh, little tidbit. Yesterday we had the opportunity in soliciting our subscription increase of the email. Got, got a chance to talk to a lot of constituents. Make sure your mic's on. I probably spoke directly to 40 to 60 of them. In a five-hour period, the number one concern is growth. Uh, but that, will, and I've explained that we're doing a review process through the ordinance. It seemed to be received well. One other little item is we reestablished the counselor corner on the e-newsletter. Uh, it's open to any counselor. I don't really want it to be Ken's corner, although <laughs> I will consume it anytime. There's a lack of interest to do that. So, Councilor Caterina. Um, no comments other than I was at the uh, election yesterday. I worked for a couple of hours at another a booth, and I went over and bothered Councilor Clucci a couple times. Um, yeah, the turnout was great, and I want to thank people for having such great interest in voting here in the town of Scarborough. So. And thank you to Tody and crew, because I know that's, having done that myself in the past, it's not an easy job. Thank you. Councilor Gleisting? Uh, yeah, just um, on what uh, Councilor Ken Johnson said, um, the, uh, the folks were, who were the most interested in uh, signing up for the newsletter are, uh, it's, at least on my shift, was the people who are new to town and they are looking for good information. Um, the, uh, we definitely need to consider getting our technology better. We, uh, it was pretty embarrassing to some extent. Um, we had two laptop kiosks there where we were going to sign people up um, and um, they just were not functional for having people do that in that particular environment. Um, for, for a few different reasons, but then I had someone else say, well, hey, um, I, like, I don't want an email. I like to get it on demand. Can I get that? And so I'm like, yes, look, there's a button, email newsletter. Well, you know, we, we put an archive out there, and it's back to December. So I think the, um, the communication is really huge. New people, young people, they want to be able to find things. I, I had a long conversation with one gentleman, you know, and he was like, all I wanted to do was find out something when I had to re-register this or something. And, you know, he was like, I couldn't even figure out what department, you know. And this was a very tech-savvy tech, tech guy. And so I said, hey, would you be interested in helping us test the new website? And he said, yes. So I have that name um, to give to Larissa. Um, so, you know, it was encouraging to talk to people. They were very grateful we were there. They were, um, they were excited that we were looking at some of these things. And I will just reiterate that, yes, growth, 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 growth. That is what people really want to know about. They're very concerned about it. And, um, you know, we've been 
in a big growth spurt, and, and people are very interested in us taking a very close look at what this all means. Um, and in terms of us feeling out of control, I would just encourage us, we do, we do control our own agenda, and sometimes things do need to slow down. So I think you know that's maybe a topic for discussion amongst ourselves and with members of the public, because that's the number two thing I hear, slow down. I guess for some of the seniors at the table, it's, it's past bedtime, so I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> yeah. and and well, I got to fly nothing out this evening. early. <laughs> I, well, I spent a lot of time at the polls yesterday as well, and uh, I, we did meet a lot of new people coming through, and it, it, it's always fascinating to me how many people in town I don't know. Um, and hanging out at the polls on election day is always a good way to realize that and, and meet new people. Um, and uh, I actually felt useful. There was a, a resident who had their trash can damaged at one of the dumps, and they didn't know how to uh, handle it. And our public works director, he was my point of contact. I asked for guidance, and he explained the process. And she was elated this morning that, that she was going to be able to get that fixed. So. Yeah, I guess my two things. One, thank you to Jay. I meant to thank him before he left, but Jay Chase tonight, that was I think Jay does an extraordinary job of presenting things um, as plainly as possible so we can all understand it. Uh, Tody, if I can make a motion to give you the day off, uh, maybe I can, but I, I think Tom <laughs> might get mad at me. I know we're down. We're a little short-staffed this week, but I totally would if, I, if, I, if we weren't short-staffed. Um, and I just wanted to um, commend uh, Councillor Johnson on the Councillor's Corner. I think as, as the guy that started the Councillor's Corner, I really think that this is a good turn and a pivot of the Council of Corner, and I can really respect that it's a vehicle to be to inform people, and it's also holding um, the readers accountable to to stay informed and, and get their neighbors to be informed. So I just I think it's I read it I read it this week, and I I was I was proud. It was very nice. So um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? All those in favor. <laughs>